What's up everybody, Zach Bellis here at my home in beautiful Baltimore, Maryland, where I recently sat down with former booking agent and founder of One Coast Entertainment, Pirate Rob Bryant, who will be leaving the music business after 13 years, um, and he'll be exiting after the annual One Coast Entertainment's Frozen Harbor Music Festival, which takes place in Baltimore, Maryland, uh, February 22nd and 23rd. Um, the the uh, interview is pretty long. It's about two hours, um, and truth be told, we probably could have sat out here for eight or nine hours if it hadn't have been so cold. Uh, you can see us shivering pretty hard in the video, and uh, the cameras hadn't have run out of battery. Um, so uh, kick back, grab yourself a bucket of whiskey, and um, enjoy this interview with Pirate Rob Bryant. What's up, everybody? Zach Bellis here from Food, Sex, and Music TV. I'm here with Pirate Rob Bryant. Uh, Pirate Rob is now leaving the music business after 13 years. Yeah, started right? in 2005. 2005, he's leaving the music business in, in after 13 years, working primarily as a booking agent um, with <clears throat> first uh, Delmarva Nightlife Entertainment and then um, for the past several years as One Coast Entertainment. And um, we're very sad to see him go, and um, we thought that we would take a minute to kind of document the journey that's gone on, because I don't know that a lot of people know the full story, and the only time that they really see or hear about Rob Bryan is either at one of his birthday bashes, or when uh, a band is in the corner giving him their uh, two, three, maybe even four cents. <laughs> <laughs> I've got, I think I've got five cents. Five cents. Yeah. Yeah. I think nickel. it was at the sound stage. I've seen you get a dime at least. I think it was at the, the sound bathroom, stage that time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, anyways, we're here and we're just going to talk to him. We're going to do just kind of like a free form chat and we're just going to like kind of um, go through your journey. So, first of all, cheers, man. Cheers. Zach, um, thanks for uh, having me on, it's man. It's been great. A, been a great ride and, and I'll just kick it off yeah. by saying that, you know, uh, a lot of the coolest shit that I was able to do in the past, I've been now 10 years in the business, um, a lot of the coolest shit that I've been able to do was uh, either a direct result of your work or at least um, you know some kind of patchwork of you of you getting us there. Thanks, so, man. Um, yeah, if I didn't give you the recognition before, <laughs> here Excuse it is now. One of, yeah. the, one of the best things uh, you, know, you said, Zach, was uh, I, I got married recently this year, and um, you put a post up saying, you know, I've been here with this guy working for, on just a handshake yeah. for 10 years, yeah. you know, so there's yeah. that handshake yeah, back, absolutely. brother. Yeah. You know, that was a great day having the whole music family out at the wedding, married a wonderful lady that I met through this journey. Yeah. You know, we were friends for years and, uh, you know, it ended up working out and, you know, here we are. So we are. I would love to rehash what we had. It was a great 13 years. We did a lot a lot of cool stuff, man. So, yeah. Where do you want to start, buddy? So, well, how about the beginning? So, you're like what in Ocean City, right? <clears throat> Ocean City. Okay, so. Uh, I mean, that's. The, I was that's a Pennsylvania boy. Okay. Um, real small town, Weatherly. Uh, we eventually had some shows there, Jam at the Jam. But yeah. anybody that's been there, real small town, and you know, some of us in 1995 had a brilliant idea. Let's go to Ocean City to be bus boys. Okay. Let's go there to make money for the summertime, you know, right. and. Uh, I ended up staying. Me and my brother, uh, Chaz, uh, we stayed, um, met some friends along the way. Uh, I graduated from college in 2002, Okay. and I'm a drummer by nature, and Chaz bought me an electric guitar starter kit right. for my college graduation from Salisbury in 2002. Um, I had some friends, Justin Bernstein and Wynn Johnston, and mm. Justin was a bass player by trade, wanted to learn guitar. I had a guitar. Win knew nothing of music, so we trained him to play bass. So we did that. <laughs> we did that for two years in our garage. Um, a year later, I believe, like late 2003, so it's probably about 18 months. We picked up our friend Mark Salito, um, great guy. You know, real punk, heavy metal instincts as far as being a singer, and we just started ripping in the garage. You know, we finally had the singer and the bass player and the guitar player, and we were absolutely terrible. Mm -hmm. And uh, the original name of our band was your mom <laughs> because it's like, yo, I saw your mom at the bar last yeah. night. Yo, your mom rocks. Yo, That's your mom sucks. Uh, you know, but then a year later in 2004, 
we met uh, another friend of ours, Blake Haley, and Blake Haley was a uh, gospel trained Southern rock country singer, uh, you know, gospel singer, like I said. And we started taking everything a little bit more seriously. And around the same time, um, Wynn Johnston, Justin Bernstein, and myself started a nightlife entertainment site called Delmar of a Nightlife. Right. Okay, so Delmar of a Nightlife was... And what year is this? <clears throat> 2004 into 2005. Okay. Okay, so okay. we have Pirate Radio, you know, right. just playing our first show. Sure. We were so bad, we went all the way to Pittsburgh to play our first show, so no, none of our friends would see us. Right. And um, <laughs> it, went, it went okay. Interesting strategy. <laughs> it went okay. So uh, at the same time, we had started Delmar of a Nightlife. It was, you know, primarily me and Wynn that actually worked on it, but it was Justin Bernstein's idea. Right. And me and Wynn just followed through with it, ran with it. Justin went on to do other things. And um, we had our first show ever. Well, first of all, Del Mar of a Nightlife was, for all intents and purposes, a nightlife entertainment website menu browser type thing. It was before MySpace was really big with information. It was really before Facebook came on being big. And what so we people would, could go on there yeah, and figure out what was going on. And I would make credit card Ocean size. City. Yeah, I would make credit card size ads, like a hundred of them every Monday, just to populate our own site with things yeah. that were going on. And um, it started to catch on when we realized that hey, we're an original band. Let's do something to promote our site. And in the area at the time, the only original music shows that went on were. Ones that were, this is Salisbury, Del Marva, Ocean City, the whole area. Right. Really, the only thing that went on was local kids would rent the VFW, they'd get a church, do something out in somebody's field. Okay. And uh, other than that, X106.9 with Skip Dixon, Crazy Eddie, everybody probably knows BK, Brennan Kashuba. Yeah. They would do quarterly rock shows. And we saw these and we were like, there needs to be more of these. So we did, we created a series called DNL Band Jams. Okay. Very simple, you know, terrible marketing, terrible names. The graphics, if you look back on them, they still exist, were absolutely horrible. I was making everything myself. I learned graphics like a month before that on fireworks, not even Photoshop. And <clears throat> February 1st, 2005, we had our first show ever at a place called Charisma, which was um, a lounge type place, you know, more high scale, you know, didn't really, not like a concert venue, sure. but we were friends with the owners and stuff and they let us come in and do stuff. And we had, the first show was, um, Dave Waugh and Wesley Howard of who became hot box. Yeah, hot box yeah. Then there was top shelf jazz who, um, eventually joined Dave Waugh and Wesley Howard in what became the original Dundadas and then pirate radio, obviously our band, yeah. you know, cause we were just filling it. It wasn't necessarily that like eventually we dropped off our own shows because we realized we weren't good enough to play our own shows, but we needed bands to get started. So that's where it all started right there. It was uh, 2005 at Charisma in Salisbury. It was our first show that we ever booked and, you know, three bands and just ran from there, man. You know? Okay. Yeah. And then the rest is history there. Yeah, a lot of it. <laughs> a lot of it. So you then know? you're end up, you're out in Ocean City. Well, you come to Baltimore somehow. Some well, like Pasadena, between Joey, 2005 and Baltimore. between 2005 and 2008, one yeah. of the things that I am personally most proud of because I consider, you know, it's been a while, but I consider Ocean City like a big part of me. You know, shout out OCMD for real. Um, like I was down there for 13 years yeah. with my brother. Um, you spend a bunch of summers and you're not a local, but you spend one winter and, and you're in. You yeah. know, so you develop a lot of family down there. And, Chaz, you know, we're down there for a while, and we worked at a place called Embers. Okay. We had yeah. 100 to 125 summer employees, all 21 to 30 years old, and we started doing these band shows more often in the summertime. And uh, Ocean City at that time was notorious for being cover band central. There yeah. wasn't anything. There was, you know, there was your cover band that, you know, did everything, you know, 70s cover band, you know, the 80s cover band, Mr. Green Jeans that was doing the cool hip stuff right now. But again, we couldn't find an original band at all. And we went to, you know, some smaller bars like the Dungeon um, on 22nd Street. We went to a place called the Broken Ore all the way downtown, did some stuff all the way uptown at Ponsetti's Pizza. But what we would do was go to these bars and be like, hey, we're going to bring an original band in. And the bar's like, no, no, you're not. Yeah. I'd be like, listen, what do you want? He goes, I want 150 people in my bar if I'm going to have a band. And I said, well, I'm going to bring three original bands. 
And he goes, why would you do that? And I said, because they're going to bring 50 people each. He goes, you do that, we're done. So start catching on. Um, a really big year that, that started happening then was 2000, the summer of 2007. Um, Bucksy Salty Dog gave us a chance, and they gave us, you know, in the industry, what's called a vertical. Um, they said every Tuesday, it's yours. Yeah. But what I want is pirate radio hosting other out-of-town bands. So this was like a dream come true for us. We uh, reached out to uh, <clears throat> people like Pressing Strings, the Grilled Lincolns, uh, Hotbox, and, you know, Dave Wong, and we're all, you know, rocking it at the time. So we would host that band, not only at the bar, but we would host them on X1069, which is, ironically, where the name Pirate Rob came from. Um, we would have a show called Live Licks at Six on X1069 that was part of our Tuesday vertical at Buxy's, and the band would come down, and this would be a band from Baltimore that really never had a lot of opportunity in Ocean City to come play original music. This is like the point that I, you know, being proud of is that we changed culture. Yeah. And that point in 2007 was when we really, you know, put ourselves on the board, and uh, we were at uh, X1069 the one day, and uh, Crazy Eddie, a great guy, host the uh, host of the show, and um, he was the you know head of the department at the time. We were getting ready to go on the air, and he's like, "Hey Rob, uh, what's your air name?" I was like, "Man, I don't have one." He's like, "Yo, we're going on the air in five minutes. Like, what's your air name?" Yeah. I was like, "I don't have one." Next thing I know, you hear, "This is Crazy Eddie and Pirate Rob X1069, <laughs> and here's a brand new track by The Grill Lincolns." And I was like, "Yo, dude, what did you just do?" I, he goes, "Don't worry, nobody's listening." I was like, "You just called me Pirate Rob to everybody." And he's like, "Again, don't worry, nobody's listening." So at the end of the show, he's like, hey, if you want, here's Pyro Rob's email. You know, get in touch with Pyro Rob. He's calling me Pyro Rob the whole time through the, through the episode. And uh, next thing I know, just bam, 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 emails. Pyro Rob, hey, Pyro Rob, I yeah. want to come to Ocean City. When I got one from Cleveland, I knew I was never ducking a Pyro Rob meeting. <laughs> yeah. um, the name originally came from our sound guy, Jude Vitilio. Again, Jude, thanks for everything. He's a great guy. Um, Pyro Radio didn't have a PA. And being a new band, we did, like, probably the most asinine thing ever. We just brought a full-fledged PA guy to every show. Yeah. No matter how big the room was, no matter how small it was, brought a PA full guy. Sound tech. And this guy comes in with your full 1970s wall of sound. Yeah. And, like, one of the things that caught on was when you knew you were going to a DNL One Coast or Pirate, or DNL Pirate Radio show, you knew you were going to a rock concert. Yeah. Like, you... No matter what it was, whether it was good or bad, it was blasting. It's going to be loud. But uh, he was old school, and uh, he he would do the Ramones thing. And it was like Pirate Wynn and Pirate Blake and yeah. Pirate Rob. <laughs> Pirate everybody. And Pirate Rob, you yeah. know, so it was cool. And then Eddie remembered that, and Eddie's the one that transferred it and took it, like, national. Yeah. And um, after that, in 2007, we got a lot of attention from a lot of other bars in Ocean City. And the next year, we were allowed to start bringing down Pasadena and Bond and Bentley um, that led into 2009 where we got into the party block and everything changed there because party block was never original music. It was always Mr. Green Jeans, yeah. all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, really started building the Ocean City market. At that time, I met in 2008, that summer, we did a place called Pulse. Um, we would have three bands a night, um, have Pasadena, The Cheaters, uh, Bond and Bentley, Hotbox was still in the mix. Pirate Radio was in there. Girl Lincolns were in there. And um, we had one really big show with me and Crazy Eddie hosting it. I remember it. I have the poster still. It's a, you know, a large poster on my wall. It's like 750 people show up to the show. Like biggest thing Ocean City's seen in a long time as far as original music. And it was called um, The Summer Schnizzle, <laughs> which is a name that Crazy Eddie came up with. <laughs> but, I mean, we had Ballyhoo on this. Yeah. Um, we had... Uh, I think it was 1154 from Baltimore was on it. Fat Daddy has been from Wilmington. Mm -hmm. And we just pumped it the whole summer of 2007. It was, uh, I remember it was uh, uh, August 22nd was the day of the show. And, you know, after that, everything changed. Um, met, I remember the deciding factors. Like I had, a, you know, was talking with uh, Robert Norton, yeah. you know, Fresh Competition, Robert sure. McFreshington, Free State Workshop, yeah. Joey Harkum, Ray Roten. And, you know, Joey talked to me. Um, I was having tentative plans of moving to Baltimore anyway. And um, Joey's like, why don't you come on up here, man? We'll, we'll start trying to do some stuff together. Um, once I got up here, it was like 2008. I was just pretty much just a promoter. Mm -hmm. You know, like these guys all had their thing. This was their town. But what they did for me was say, listen, this guy's going to be honest. This guy's going to be the 
good job and you're going to love the product at the end of the day that it's really going to be a slamming show or something and you know we did some stuff it took a little while to work up and um that february i i had gotten here in october of 2008 and by february of 2009 i got um, the guys at soundstage to you know have an open ear not soundstage i'm sorry sonar sonar at that time and it was uh Mon- or uh, sorry, Sunday, uh, February 15th, going into President's Weekend. And I knew all the bands probably would have been sleeping on the fact that it was a holiday the next day. So I call up Ballyhoo, I call up Hot Box, I call up Grill Lincolns, I call up Bond and Bentley and uh, um, Pasadena. And I was like, what are you guys doing that day? And they're like, nothing. I was like, I'm going to have a birthday party at Sonar. Like, you guys want to play it? And it started out as the biggest joke ever. Like, seriously, I was half punking myself by having Pirate Rob's birthday bash. Yeah. Okay, so it was, the first one was like five bands. Um, room wasn't necessarily sold out. It was only the 400 person room, but it was pretty close. Like, we were 300 plus. And um, something just changed from that day. You know, like a week later, I got a call from Ramsey. Like, hey, man, do you want to have your birthday bash at our place next year? So yeah. this is like a year in yeah. advance. We're looking at booking one of my promotions. And I just got here from Baltimore or from Ocean City. And one of the cool things, you know, about it was like the bands were as much of a part of it as I was. Because like I was the ringleader, you know, Rob, your job is to think, you know, like your job is to plan these things. Like, you're right. We wouldn't have thought of putting this show together, but we'll play it, you know, because it's the right thing to do to, you know, start building a scene and a movement and a family. And uh, a lot of things just kind of, you know, spurred off from there, you know. So, like, by that time then, you know, it was, like I said, January, or sorry, February 2009, I'm already, you know, in Baltimore, you know, doing, starting to do our thing. Okay, so we're we're in Baltimore again, February, you know, 2009. We we had this birthday bash thing, and um, something changed uh, at that time. People were interested, you know, bands were calling me. You know, they're like, who are you? What are you doing? You know, there was people hating. There was people loving. You know, there was all that. But I started to be like, I want to do something with this. Like, this isn't this isn't just fun. You know, like, coming out of Ocean City, it was fun. And, like, I was like, I'm good at this. I want to move forward with it. The bands we have were absolutely spectacular. Um, probably the thing that made me believe in doing what I was doing the most was the level of talent that we had um the fans were great and um 2009 i guess like that year um we, st- we started doing some things we do we had our 420 shows you know uh we had our first 420 show in 2006 at brew river was amazing um those guys really gave us a chance you know to do something there for i, I believe it f- stood for years possibly five to five to more years as the busiest day in brew river history it was a 420 um, show. We had 20 bands on 420 <laughs> for free. The yeah. bands played for free. I played worked for free. Yeah. And the sound guy got paid a thousand bucks. You know, like that because he had to. You know, but like that's what Tony had. Packed. Yeah. You know, because we were entrenched. You know, when we were down there, um, the kids from Salisbury University, with the help of the original Don Dot as Dave Law, those guys, um, their fan base really got into what we were doing. And that um, place packed is thousands of people. Yeah. That's thousands of kids. It was. <laughs> You know, we we were thinking fifteen hundred to two thousand people were out there that day for the for the four twenty show. But yeah. that four twenty show carried over. We kept doing those things. We would do them at Brew River. We ended up doing them at the Whiskey, um, which was a big part of what we did. The Whiskey in Annapolis with Mike Hearn. Thanks yeah. for everything you did, yeah. Mike. Um, it was great down there. What a great scene that was. You know, this whole that whole era to me was uh, back and forth between Baltimore. We would be doing shows in Baltimore. We'd be doing shows in Ocean City. We'd be doing shows in Annapolis. Annapolis, and if we were really lucky, we'd put a weekend together to do a show in Baltimore, Ocean City, and Annapolis, and yeah. that was like the, the the first smell of what I did as tour booking. Yeah. You know, it was like those little that couple runs, there, and yeah. we'd start going up to, uh, you know, my hometown, Weatherly in Pennsylvania. We'd get to Pittsburgh, um, get some stuff up in the Buffalo and in New Jersey, and we start covering, you know, those territories, and... Um, Buffalo was kind of a surprise, right? Didn't yeah, Buffalo, Buffalo was... was it was still an anomaly to me, like, even a year or two into it, like, um, where we're still at, like, 2010. Um, we'll get back to Buffalo because, you know, that's that's something I want to devote some time to. But okay. um, Well, I guess just to, like, quickly address it, the out-of-nowhere 
people from Buffalo. Like there's, they come up here and play, and then all there's of a, a sudden, long story behind that. Though. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. We'll, we'll jump into okay, that. We'll get yeah, well, because that that needs some some devotion. That's um, there was a couple towns that were like that, and they were for the same reason. And uh, there's a story there. And that's a good story. It's a, for, yeah. especially for people who are starting with bands now to know like yeah, there's the you know you think the big markets, but yeah. a lot of the times it's it's you know Omaha, right. Nebraska, or Fort Wayne, Indiana that you're really making traction. So 2010, we were working, you know, all that stuff, working towards um, my first Rams head, Pyre Rob's birthday bash. Right? right. And again, this is as much an honor to me as it is still a joke in the back of my head. Like, I wasn't really trying to bring attention to myself as much as I was just trying to trick my friends into playing a cool show. Yeah. Like, I really was like, hey, dummies, come play this. And they're like, oh, I mean, got us. Then it was the thing, you know, yeah. like, so we're working towards that show. As it's getting closer, um, we had 86 the effort on that, Ballyhoo, Pasadena, you know, normal, sus, you know, uh, the usual suspects, yeah. um, Bond and Van Lee, Grove Lincolns, a couple others. And there was a terrible snowstorm that week. Like within a week, Baltimore received two 24 inch plus snowstorms about three days apart. And I was looking at this massive show that I had, like, the biggest thing I've ever done. And I was like, this thing's going to get snowed out. Like, this isn't cool. Um, we had a great week that week. Um, Grove Lincoln's lived in Federal Hill. We all were snowed in, partying, uh, playing music. Um, people were just, come get me. Come pick me up. I'm stranded. Come, I want to come to the you know the party at Grill Lincoln's house or something. Yeah. And it was really a great week. Um, as we're getting closer and closer and closer, Wednesday comes, it snows again. You know, so that's the second snowstorm. That's the second big snowstorm. I'm like, oh, my God, this is terrible. Like, this show is on Saturday. This is going to be awful. And Friday comes. It's looking all right. Snow's starting to melt. Boom. Next day, Saturday, like 50 to 60 degrees. Yeah. It is absolutely amazing yeah. out. Roads were just clear. People were, honest to God, like cabin fevered in for like 10 days. Yeah. And 1,000 plus 1,100 people actually showed up for that show for a local show, no national headliner, no nothing. And it just took off after that. Like, it was like phone calls after phone calls, like, yo, Rob, you, you're the guy. I want to work with you. Yeah. I want to work with you. It was so humbling, you know, like I never took it to my head or anything really, or at least I tried not to. Like, I knew it was still, like, the music, and I was kind of just the ringleader. You know, yeah. it was like, let's drive this ship in the right direction. And... um Going into that summer, you know, we were doing more of the same, the Whiskey Annapolis. We'd get some places, go here and there, you know, do some local shows, um, do some local touring, some regional touring. And came to the summer, and uh, there was a guy, Lauren Heinisch, mm -hmm. who was the um, manager slash agent of the Grill Lingots at the time. He owned a company called Red Carpet Entertainment. And me and him got together on the sole reason of booking bands at Napa. And we just started this the side. College, yeah, yeah, the like college booking agency. College yeah. Yeah. And that was our like sole purpose of really getting together and doing this stuff. Um, I had no clients at the time. I was still a promoter. Um, I was heavily involved with, you know, promotions with, you know, Pasadena Grove Lincoln, Bond and Van Lee, Buff and Uglies were starting to come around at sure. that time too. And when me and Lauren started a company, um, it was about the same time that um, Matt Ritchie left Pasadena. Yeah. Um, Matt, Rich Matt Ritchie was one of the guys that did a lot of the bookings and everything for them. Um, oh, okay. Bond and Bentley, Ray Roden came to me and Lauren and said, you know, I want you guys to be our, our booking agent. And uh, we signed him up right away. And uh, right after that, we, uh, Joey came and was like, listen, man, like, you know, we need a booking agent now that Matt's gone. Like, do you want to start, like, working with us? And, um, man, a lot, you know, well, that's where, at that time, that was One Coast Entertainment. One Coast was born from that. Um, we were having, uh, I believe it was with Todd DeHart um, from uh, Good Clean Fun Life in Ocean City and his yeah. wife, Natalie. They've mm -hmm. always been big supporters, but we were at Lockstock in Ocean City in that summer, 2010. And uh, I've always had a utopian dream of everybody just working together and everything just be beautiful. And, yeah. You know, like everybody just being a team and, you know, getting ahead through cooperation, not competition. And we started talking about like bands from Florida and stuff like this. And we're standing there and we're having a conversation. And I was like, I don't know why we all don't work together, man. It's all one coast. And like somebody stopped me and was like, dude, yeah, 
that yeah, I was like, yeah, that's it, one coast, and like it's been one coast entertainment ever since then. Um, you know, like I said, we started picking up booking clients from that, and uh, moving forward into that year, um, we had you know birthday bash again annually. Yeah. So we start doing things as one coast things start really picking up. Um, that year, the birthday bash ended up being thirteen hundred and like eighty six people. We were like fourteen tickets away from selling out Ramshead on a local show. Like I remember talking to one of the bands, and they're like, "Oh, don't worry, man. Our guys always get walk ups." And I was like, "There's not any walk ups available. Like <laughs> yeah. it's sold out." And I was yeah. like, "You guys better go sell those tickets you yeah. have." And they're like, "Oh man, yeah, okay, we'll get out there and do yeah. that." Yeah. And um, <laughs> You know, so, you know, that was the promotions thing. That was kind of the height of, you know, what we did with DNL because DNL was still the promotions company that ran right. those things. Uh, One Coast was, you know, different. We were trying to focus on band bookings. Um, never booked a national tour. It was never, you know, never anything I thought about doing. Like, I booked some regional stuff. And um, again, Joey from, you know, Pasadena was like, listen, man, we just want to go west. Like, we can get ourselves up and down the East Coast you know, with some help, you know, but um, we just want to go west. So that first year we did the uh, Living in Circles tour, which was, you know, a lyric from one of the Pasadena songs. Yeah. And um, pretty much what we did was play every single market from Buffalo to Denver in repeat out and back, yeah. <laughs> you know, to put together our first tour. But, you know, it was something that, you know, bands at that time at our level, nobody was doing that kind of stuff. Like it was, it was an inspiration to other people. Bands bigger than us were doing that. Bands with national booking agencies, you know, were doing that kind of stuff. But it was the first time we kind of did it. And I had to put this stuff together. Cold calling, you know, like Facebook and everything wasn't in full swing yet where you could just reach out to everybody through that Still angle. Need pick up the phone Still need to pick emails, up the yeah. phone yeah. and, you know, do some emails. Yeah. And God, thank God for the Internet because I don't know how people ever book shows yeah. back in the 80s and 70s <laughs> and, and stuff like that. Like like yellow pages and really if you think about it that's a lot of the reasons like a lot of bands didn't do that stuff back in the day you know and if they did they were doing it when they were doing it on the diy level they were like hey i'm going to play with my friend in clearwater you know or something like that that, that's what the you know the extent of it was but um you know so we start doing that stuff and uh 2011 you know that that took off um eventually you know that whole thing just snowballed in, into you know what it would become what one coast was um we eventually you know a year t- maybe i think it was i think it was 2013 eventually that we put the dnl you know to bed dnl again belmar the nightlife it was a, a regional thing you know it was something that didn't really transfer nationally you know we just it had to be earlier than that actually it was about it had, 2013 I think, no i think it had to be it had to be 2011. Well, not until maybe because you were thinking about it, and because you were you came to me and you were like, "Hey, we want we want ground score on this." Yeah. And and I was like, "Whoa, yeah, we're breaking up." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we had it was like it was like exactly. a couple. It's like you're on a couple good things. With, you're after. on a couple good things with us. We definitely. did a lot of good things. Yeah, yeah we did a lot. Of, our ground score is a lot of. I mean, that's how I got in touch with you in the first place. Was Chase actually reached out? You were right. still DNL at the time. Yeah. But Chase reached out to you because he really we had really some mutual to friends too. City. I think there we had some mutual friends through Win. Um, uh, maybe yeah. yeah that, I just knew know. Chase had a hard on for Ocean City. He really really wanted. Right. To yeah. I was like, what the fuck is this about? Like, I mean, <laughs> you know, like yeah. I mean, I'm I'm down in Virginia, so I'm like, okay, let's hit DC, let's hit Baltimore, let's hit yeah. all the cities. Yeah. And he's like, let's go to Ocean City. I always found Ocean City to be valuable, and people, you know, I found it to be valuable because of what I knew about it. Um, you know, what you want is a younger crowd. You want people that are into this stuff. You want college kids. Sure. Um, if you play the right shows in Ocean City over the course of the summer, you can actually probably play to one student from every single exactly. college on the East exactly. Coast. Exactly. Like somebody from any instead market, of going, yeah. you know, instead of going to the University of Maine and the University of Miami, those people might be in Ocean City. There's an average yeah. of like thirty thousand summertime employees that yeah. come down there, all college age, you know, just down there working, having a good time with their friends, checking out music and yeah. everything. And people on vacation. It was it was really valuable. There's a lot of you know connections and stuff that like we made from down there people were just like boom you know like yeah. oh wow i saw you guys in ocean city why don't you guys come here you know yeah and look at it and move you know make moves like that but um i think it was something you know like we eventually probably around 2013 you know we finally because i know jam at the jam that we eventually did in 2014 was fully under the one coast 
That was the first joint of the day? That was the last. Actually, no, that was the last joint of the day. Yeah, it was the last, but I think that was like the first time that was under the one person. And um, the first jam at the dam, um, that's a whole other subject. What a great story, you know, getting into the jam at the dam. I think you guys did, Ground Score did one or two of those. We did, um, you did one and then I did one. Yeah, okay. You did one and then I did one with my band and I did one acoustic. I think you did the 2011 one. 2011 was a great building year for everything yeah. that we did. It had um, to be because we broke up 2000, late 2011. All right, let's talk about Jam at the Dam because that was a really cool festival. I know that if you probably asked, you know, a thousand people, a thousand of like the true One Coast fans, what their favorite, most memorable thing, it would either be Jam at, Jam at the Dam, I would think it would be number one, actually. You might think Frozen Harbor, but I would say that Jam at the Dam, I hear more about people being like, oh, man, I miss Jam at the Dam, Jam at the Dam. Um, festival out in your hometown of Wever- Weatherly, PA. Yeah. Multi-day, mm-hmm. kind of like a like a mini Bonnaroo. Yeah, we, uh, I've always been, <laughs> from from day one, I've always been one that, hey, if it works, uh, let's, let's replicate it, let's duplicate it, let's yeah. expand upon it. Sure. And, um, you know, if the bars, you know, somebody said, I want five bands, you know, I'm bringing 10, you know, just sure. to make sure everybody's happy yeah. and um, get the numbers in there that we need. And um, first year, a friend of ours, a uh, family of the Millers up in Weatherly, where I'm from, our hometown, um, Dave Miller was having his uh, college graduation party. And from my works with Pasadena, they, you know, kids up there really started liking them. They requested that Pasadena come up there. And we were all at a power plant the night before Pasadena was playing with uh, um, Can't Hang at the yeah. power plant when they had the old stage out yeah. like by the McDonald's mm-hmm. facing backwards instead of the new stage. And we just actually kidnapped a couple people and threw them in the <laughs> van with us and said, we're going to the Poconos for the night. They didn't care. Um, the property the Miller family had was in their family for years. Um, it's a clay earthen dam. It looks like a pond, but you know, due to the, you know, the way it's actually structured and everything, it's considered a dam. A dam. Okay. And, uh, you know, the family has had it for years. A couple brothers built their you know, houses around it, and then the brothers had kids. Dave was uh, one of those kids. They invited us up there, and back in the day, the, the brothers used to have bands out on these gazebo-type boat docks that are built out over the water and would be the stage. So we uh, had Pasadena play there, and we had, like, maybe 10 people with us that were, you know, from weather. And it was magical. The event, the way it was, uh, the stage was built back to into a natural amphitheater almost. Right. It was right on this little hidden cove on the water. Um, you know, just an amazing place to watch a band. The yeah. band, actually, the backdrop of the band was the water. Was the water yeah. Instead of the other way around, you know, it was, it was amazing. And um, we got a phone call from them the next year, and they're like, we really want to do this again. It's going to be our other son, Chris's 21st birthday. Here's me. Hey, if I'm going to do it, I'm bringing 11 bands. Yeah. I think it was even 14 bands. Yeah. We had um, Sweet Lita, Pasadena, Bond, and Bentley, Bumpin' Uglies, a couple bands from Philly. Uh, first time I ever met Matt and Andy uh, from the band Andel at the time, who uh, Matt went on to actually form Troll Tribe with uh, Jason Pierce. Um, okay. You know, it's the current band that we're using yeah, yeah, now, yeah. Yeah. Uh, or, you know, that's playing with us now. And uh, it was an amazing day. Uh, we probably had, you know, two, three hundred people max, you know, show up at this one stage. And it was just something that took off. And uh, the next year, coming in 2012, they have another stage like this across the water. And then they have a large pavilion on top of this mountaintop, which is a good football field's walk up, a, up the mountain, up a stone road. But uh, we came in that year, and I believe we did – 40 to maybe 40 bands that year and uh, it just was you know the first time a lot more people got exposure to it the first year was like oh what's that the second year everybody you know started catching on and wanted to come up then we started adding some different bands and um, people you know camp out overnight we had a nice pine forest where everybody would camp in and um, bands from you know Virginia I think that was the first one you you know one of the ones you guys played um, bands from Jersey, New York, yeah. uh, all over the place, Ohio, people were coming in from that. 
and um, it just really took off and built into something like great. We ended up doing Jam at the Dam, um, 13, 2013, and the last year was 2014. The last year that it ended, um, we had four stages, two days, 80 bands, and you know we 80 went bands. 80 bands, um, which was the you know logistics. It was great, you know, and I ran it with a team of five. Um, yeah. It was something that we just all had a natural knack at. The bands were very cooperative for the most part. The fans were amazing. It was something really set about the site, uh, the beauty of the lake, the trees around it, the you know just the serenity. Like people just got there and enjoyed themselves as much as the music and you know the whole festival was magic. It was the spot. You know, some places they say you just have those those natural energies, and you know I really attribute that to that. Um, Jam at the Dam was one of the things that allowed us to, you know, start reaching out a little bit more to some bands from out of town because, you know, it's bands want to play festivals, yeah, and this was a, a festival that we had control over, and, you know, we wanted to do that because working with bands from out of the area would really help our bands, you know, get to those areas and everything. And um, eventually we stopped because, uh, you know, the landowners, you know, they weren't, they didn't even have any problems. It was just like the festival was getting bigger, you know, and they they needed the land for houses and they actually built two houses on there while we were still having the festival and everything. The last year we had to bring in our own main stage and use that. Um, but, you know, overall, it was just an amazing, amazing experience. I look back on it like I would spend, I'd spend like two to three weeks there helping landscape and just broom the land and everything like while we were, you know, getting it ready, making sure there's no creepy rattlesnakes all over the place or anything. Yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah, man, it was just, just always, like, one of the things I look forward to, like, all summer long. Like, um, it was something really special to bring that art and culture to my hometown, yeah. too. Um, it was something that I always, like, dreamed to keep going. Yeah. Unfortunately, we haven't uh, been able to secure land in the area that, like, makes a lot of sense as far as bringing in. This land had infrastructure as far as power base, water bases, yeah. stuff like that. Roads already made. Um, you know, as far as staging was already, you know, we had stuff that we could use there for stages. It was really rustic. It was really, you know, uh, you know, backwoodsy or whatever. It was, it was too quaint. Perfect with the land. Yeah, it was quaint. Like the natural bridges, yeah. like the land bridges, those were so cool. It was, it was, it was cool. a really cool property. It was like the the festival was kind of set up on its own little circuit. We would just turn stage to stage yeah. to stage. It wasn't, walk around it wasn't like some festivals where you walk back and forth from one stage to one stage. Like, mm. you could just walk past things. There'd be so people fun. set up over here just playing you know there'd be people doing stuff over here whatever and it was just it was just always a great time um very cool festival, yeah. trying to think if there's any like extra special memories you i know, have from one. you have, have one, one from jam oh, to absolutely dam? yeah okay. uh, it was 2013 the glove lincoln set oh yeah it was just magical man that was just magical it was like everyone was out there it was just like the perfect day Somebody brought one billion glow sticks. Yeah, and yeah, and water. I cleaned, I them, I cleaned them all up yeah. the next day. It was, it was, uh, you know it was, it was someone, completely like, worth it, though. Yeah, like, it was completely wait, worth it. Wait for the cue. Yeah, you know? and then and I don't know how everyone knew, but the cue came, and then just like we never had the the psychedelic festival atmosphere. It wasn't really what we were going for, you know. But um, it was nice that year. It was planned yeah. that um, the Grilled Lincolns were gonna you know do something like that. We structured their set like that yeah. we structured them on the stage that would have worked best with the late night kind of atmosphere and um and they're phenomenal yeah that was so, that was a that was a really great situation that there. was that i think was my number one number one jam at the dam uh, memory the other one would be i mean you look back on that some of the biggest you know at our time you know and now moving forward like some of the bigger names on the east coast like you know in the, in the east coast like music scene now um, bumping uglies tropidelic mm-hmm. sun-dried vibes mm-hmm. uh you know, these guys are all out there still doing it. And, like, we had them all. Um, you know, Treehouse was there. Shrub was there. Uh, Bad Daddy Hasbro, I think we had them up there once or twice. Love Betty. You know, uh, people just from all over. You know, we had, we had a great time with that. Yeah, uh, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, I think Bayuka even came up there one time, maybe. I'm not sure. From Arizona? Yeah, I think they might have been <laughs> up in the summer the one time. They kind of came up with them. I could, I could be misspoken on that you know, one. But I mean, we're talking hundreds of bands. That was the that we'll was the one thing it the definitely flyers, was. Go through the flyers, and figure out. Yeah, we go go through looking at all that stuff. Um, you know, sometimes looking back on it, I mean, we've, you know, just with what we've done, we've always focused on a lot of the multi band showcases, festival type atmosphere with our shows. You know, I've probably personally done fifty shows with twenty bands or more. You know, right there at that. Um, 
if I had to give an estimate of total bands that we might have worked with, I'd probably have to say it's between four and five thousand. Talk on that for a minute. That's four or five thousand bands. That's incredible. I so think it's a, like what's you know I can't be sure that? Like, how do you, you know how do you but keep that like track of that? but if you we don't you know because it, it was nothing was ever about keeping no, I, score. I just mean no, that's know, not but, about keeping score. I mean more in terms of just like you have eighty bands coming over yeah. four days. Like how do you? deal with the logistics of that like i mean, I, mean I eventually i eventually got a partner frank lewis uh frank uh came in and joined one coast and frank's specialty frank is a production guru um you know that's his thing you know he really prides himself on you know running the show really well um you know but up until that point you know before frank came in like um he came in about 2013 mm-hmm. 2012 into 2013 mm-hmm. and um it was just something like I organized in my head, <laughs> you yeah. know, I use a lot of stuff on yellow legal pads, you yeah. know, I use a lot of stuff, <laughs> WordPad on, uh, you know, Facebook, or I mean, sorry, on, on my laptop and everything. I use, use a lot of that. Um, but it was a natural gift that I had of keeping these things organized. I could, I could tell you the set times in my head, you know, I could do, you know, I could tell you the date of the date of the calendar months ahead of time, you know, like there's, you know, just things that I was, I was really good at, you know, doing these things. And the logistics of actually maybe planning out everything was uh, a little left short because like um, I didn't always have enough help. It was just something I wanted to do. And like most people are understanding like, Hey, it's two or three guys running these events. But um, it was, you know, I, I really was just blessed with some kind of skill, you know, to, to keep it all organized in my own head. And like a lot of people would come in and be like, Rob, how are you doing this? I'd be like, I have no idea. I can't explain it to you. I can't, I can't tell you, you know, like if you come in and try to help out right now, I, it would take more time for you to help, you know, for me to tell you than, than it to, would to just, than it would to just do yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. But, um, uh, to me, the idea is just keep it simple, stupid. Um, it's replication. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, we move to jam at the dam. We have one stage. What do you do? You're going to add another stage. Yeah, yeah. It's exactly yeah. the same thing. What you did on the one stage, <clears throat> do it again. The other stage, obviously you can't have the same bands, but you know, replication 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 so if you're you go one two add another one each year you know it really just moves in that kind of cycle you know like there's particular challenges with the music business because you're dealing with a lot of people who aren't necessarily professional in the traditional sense you a lot know, of egos a lot of you know could be our name isn't big yeah. enough on the flyer uh you know there's always that and, yeah um the one thing that we kind of really did was we filtered that stuff out a lot. Um, if you came in and you were that guy, you weren't right to work with us. We were uh, we were a band family first and foremost. Um, it wasn't my family. It wasn't necessarily my business. It was a band family that worked together. And I was the pot that's you know the the straw that stirred the drink or something yeah. like that. But um, you know a lot of a lot of bands came through like that. Um, there were some bands in the future you know that you know got a little worse like that you know. But um, stuff that you know we dealt with early on in the days was if you didn't click you didn't click like yeah. we weren't um i don't know i wouldn't say we were you know it was a situation where we were looking to keep people out or anything like that we were more inviting of everybody of like we wanted everybody I mean, there in. Were thousands of bands yeah but you know at the time like <laughs> pretty much when you you know you're working with 80 bands and everybody's getting along except band number 77 you know it's like they just might not get the phone call the next year and if they call back you know it'd be like hey we got to address what you did wrong try to look you know look at that and you know move forward from that and try to you know do better next year you know do something different but you know there there is a lot of unprofessionality and like i was you know i could definitely be targeted myself or pointed out many times for being unprofessional but that was the whole situation we were all under the radar of the industry still at this time like everything we were doing like isn't industry standard isn't industry levels none of us were connected but still, we were doing all this, like, you know, moving it along, stirring yeah. it, getting getting it moving. Creating you know? our own ecosystem, mm-hmm. kind of, yeah, I understand. That's, that's really what it was, yeah, definitely. And, uh, you know, looking back on, you know, again, on Jam at the Dam, it was, just, it was one of the, the disappointments that we couldn't keep it going because it really was, you know, magical. And, it you know, most of the time you hear of a festival or something stopping, it's because it went wrong. Everything with this one went right. But we couldn't really translate it over to a different piece of space. We couldn't translate it over to a different piece of land economically. Sure. 
um, Jam at the Dam wasn't something that we ever really ran seeking profit. Like Jam at the Dam was like, hey man, let's hope we don't lose too much money this year, <laughs> you know, type of thing. And we never really lost lost money except you know one year, and that was on our own choice because 2014 we sunk some money into the project to make it a building year, and um, we didn't have 2015, so we never recouped you know that investment. Yeah, but from the building, you know, it's all right. Like you yeah. know, we still still look back on it, man. It was a great time with my wife. I was really proud of you know bringing those people to my town. Um, showing people what Weatherly is, showing Weatherly what these folks are doing with themselves, getting kids up there who struggle from a lot of uh, drug dependencies and everything like that, just from lack of things to do. Um, you know, just like the whole world, uh, opiates were a big problem in rural America. And it it's hit Weatherly, man. It hit Weatherly really hard. And, um, you know, I wanted to bring something there to show people they're coming at this, uh, you know, some positive stuff from some folk who some entertainment, some atmosphere, some vibes, you know, like, um, I think it did a lot. Um, the town wasn't necessarily on our side, you know, at first, and then eventually, like, you know, we were having a positive impact on the economy. Nobody got killed. There, you know, there, there wasn't a bunch of crazy sure. people running around their town. Everyone, everyone you know, has like, horror stories from Woodstock. So yeah, like, like and, what? <laughs> you know, people, yeah. you know, you got a small town, people think stuff like that, but, you know, eventually really what it caught on, and now I actually live in Weatherly now, all I hear all the time is like, man, when's Jam the Dam coming back? Yeah. When is Jam the Dam coming back? And we hear it from all our friends and fans. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, you said. You I'd know. say that'd be the number one. Like, and I think, um, you know, you compared it to Frozen Harbor. I think the difference with Frozen Harbor is that it was uh, still going on. Yeah. You know, uh, situation, you know, with me leaving, Frank's going to keep Frozen Harbor moving. And, uh, you know, if Frozen Harbor ever goes away, then we're probably going to start hearing oh, man, when are you bring Frozen Harbor back? Sure, you know, like, yeah. you know, but Jam at the Dam was a special time. It was magical. Uh, a lot of people made a lot of friends there. Uh, you know, getting out and camping. And, you know, everybody's dressed down a little bit, sweaty and smelly. You know, it's not like you're in the bars and all dressed up. No, and, yeah. You know, like, people were real, you know, when they were out there. And um, from a fan's point of view, one of the things that, you know, people really liked was that there was no real separation between artists and fans at Jam at the Dam. Like, you go to a lot of festivals and there's, you know, the artist places or you might see, you know, oh, an artist yeah. walking through. Yeah. But at Jam at the Dam, we usually had as many artists on site as we did fans, which isn't great for being profitable. But again, that's not really why we ran the event. And I could say that most of our artists were as much of a fan as the other bands as totally. the fans were. You know, so, Absolutely. Yeah. And then you got to have cool moments like Scribe just walking around with his guitar. Yeah. Oh. And Ben with the upright bass. Cheesy. And they're just going from campsite <laughs> to campsite just playing like, you know, you walk Scribe around, songs. You walk and around the back. Like, Fuck of the, yeah. yeah, you walk around the back of the dam and you got Cheesy in the Drackers. You got Cheesy back there with his little booth that he had set up every yeah. day. Hey, what's up, yeah. man? Guys, you have his merch booth in like the yeah. back part of the I lake. It, and, like, yeah, the whole thing was. I love that everyone bought their cool. flags. You know, yeah. like they had their uh -huh. flags from what states they were playing to see where everybody was from. Like, yeah. eventually, like you know, and you get people coming from all over, Virgin Islands included. Yeah. And was... um, and my, I think one of my favorite, other favorite memories was when um, Scott, rest in peace, um, fell asleep at the sound booth at like three in the morning. <laughs> he just had, he'd been crew cranking all day because yep. if you know that guy, he's like very very high energy, and uh, it was just funny to see him. He was like, he's an energy drink. Yeah, Scotty. And they're like, Scott, can we get some more vocals? And he's like, Scott? <laughs> huh? What? Yeah. <laughs> you know, but that's what it was all about. Like, it was very vibey, stress-free, you know, type of type of thing. And, like, there were some things in this business that I did for money. There were some things in this business that I did for the bands. And there were some things in this business I did for me. And Jam at the Dam was one of them. Yeah. Jam at the Dam was my project. My pet. You can tell. My, uh, my favorite thing every year was uh, the people hanging their flags. Yeah. Started to encourage people from you know different states to bring their flags yep. and, and hang them up there. And, uh, you know some of those pictures from Rachel Spence and everything. I just man, I look back on those and they're just awesome. You know, so it was a really good time. You know, in in DNL and One Coast and, and everything that we did. Okay, so you worked with let's say close to five thousand bands over uh, an estimate, years. an estimate. Yeah, yeah okay. I, I mean, mean, so thousands. Let's say just thousands, thousands of yeah. bands. Uh -huh. um, you know, so what about and this is from a promotional standpoint. These yeah, are all bands that you're promoting. They're they're not necessarily like 
So the, yeah. then there's bands that you worked with as a, uh, under contract as a booking agent. Yeah, we had uh, we had many of bands under the promotional you know status that we might have worked with one time. We might have hosted them on a show once or twice, but um, eventually one DNL was the promoter's house at the time. Um, Lauren and I started one of those to actually start booking and managing bands. I would say we never really got into the true aspect of managing anything, maybe except for business side. Mm-hmm. But getting into true band management, I don't say that. That was something we really ever did. Um, what we focused on was booking. And um, none of us knew it, really. You know, me and Lauren didn't really know it very well at the time. Um, Lauren ended up eventually, you know, leaving the company. It was just me, you know, for a good two two years. And um, we were working with clients. Um, our main clients at the time were Grill Lincolns, Pasadena. Uglies, Bond and Bentley. Um, we ended up working with a bunch of, you know, other clients for a while too. We had, you know, we, I think, you know, I would never say that Ground Squirrel was a client, but we definitely like, you know, worked pretty closely with you guys too. So a little again, bit. to come back to the handshake thing, like I always yeah. considered us working together as Ground Squirrel, as right. Zach if, Bell, if you, Zach Bell and the company band, all that stuff. Yeah, if you called me, like, you know, we would, we definitely we did a lot of business pre- together. We definitely had that to relationship. To not say that we were um, working together. Yeah, there was a, uh, you know, we would move. We moved into some other situations where we started working with some out of town bands as far as doing bookings for them. Um, you know, we worked with Wise Eyes pretty pretty much a bunch of times locally. Tommy McGee was with us for a little while. Um, we worked with uh, Resonated out of Florida, yeah. who was one of the first mm-hmm. bands on Right Coast Records with Valley Who. Um, right. I was <laughs> walking out in California, in 2014, and I get a phone call from Howie, and he's like, "Hey, man, you're doing you know a great job with you know these guys, East Coast reggae stuff and everything." Like. Would you like to, you know, start working with Resonated? And to me, it was like Michael Jordan had just called me. It was like, hey, man, yeah. you want to start, like, you know, yeah. training with some of my guys? Yeah. Be like, oh, yes, of course. Yeah. You know, it was it was great, like, having that phone call from Howie that day. Like, really meant a lot to me. I think I kind of went and cried in the corner a little yeah. bit after that. But um, that was a good three years into what we were doing. Um, Grill Lincolns. And uh, so we talked about, you know, with the tour bookings and just general bookings. And, you know, we, we had a book. We had a book to pay rent. We had a book shows to eat. We had a book shows to grow the band. We had a book shows to tour. Um, there's a lot of different reasons why we had a book shows. You know, um, at at this day and age, you know, a lot of bands are just booking. You know, the right way to book a band is to tour and grow your band. Like we yeah. had a lot of different constraints. Like, hey, bro, I got a car payment. <laughs> like all that right. stuff. Yeah. Um, but so the first tour tour that we did was. Uh, like we talked about earlier, it was 2000, the summer of 2011, with Pasadena going to Colorado. And I remember Bumpin' Ugly's brand at Hardesty. The guy was always, like, so driven. And he's like, Rob, we're going to California next year. Like, I don't care if you're going to help me or I'm going to do it or whatever. I'm going to California next year. I don't care. I'm going to put it all on my credit card or what we have to do. And I don't know how he convinced them, but he convinced the girl Liggins to go with them. And it was a... Uh, the Broken Down by the River Tour, June 2012. Yeah. Um, Brandon did a lot with his connections to, uh, you know, help out with the California like aspect of things, like from actually from Seattle down. Mm-hmm. Um, I did a bunch of stuff out to Colorado on the routing and you know on the way back, some Florida stuff, everything you know here and there, and uh, we put it together. Um, we get it done. I am not going on tour with. I went on tour with Pasadena. I couldn't go on this tour. And um, my partner in DNL at the time, Wayne Johnson, had just moved to Los Angeles. And, you know, this shaped up to be one of the greatest experiences of my life. I've never really been across country at this time. I've been to Colorado. And Wynn calls me. He's like, hey, man, I need somebody to drive a U-Haul to Los Angeles and move all my stuff out here. And I'm like, when do I leave? He goes, tomorrow. I said, yeah, okay, yeah. cool. So uh, it works out that I leave – DC. He was living in DC at the time, you know, Arlington. I leave Arlington um, at twelve and get to Chicago at twelve as uh, the second night of Grilled Lincoln's or third night of Grilled Lincoln's and uh, Bumpin' Ugly's tour as in Chicago, and I catch up with them and did tell them I was coming. They're walking out of the bar and missed, you know, pretty much everything. They're getting ready to come out of the bar, and they're like, "Rob, what are you doing here?" I was like, "I don't know, man, but this is awesome." So like, let's go. So like, I was a big part of booking this tour too. With, you know, me and Brandon. It was a one coast tour you know we really did all the work and um 
we go, you know, through Omaha, you know, we did a show there, get to Colorado, we're in Denver. And one of the things that I remember Brandon always saying is we got to go across the Rockies and we got to go across the Rockies. And I remember going with Pasadena and we get to Denver and I'm just staring at those mountains with like childish, like awe and wonder and like sadness of like, we're stopping. I was like, cause I know there's some really cool stuff on the other side of those mountains and like we're turning around and going home. So it was like the whole next calendar year was like, mentally with you know all the energy was just dedicated to breaking the rockies and um remember i'm driving a u-haul <laughs> at this time so we're uh um i would take turns with you know folks jumping in the u-haul with me you know the one day baki did it the other day robbie d from the grill wings did it well this was the day we we're going over the rockies it never really was planned out but it was uh kind of very symbolic that it ended up being me and brandon hardesty to be the first people from one coast to break the continental divide in a (laughs) u-haul as we're driving on our way to salt lake and um spent the time with them in salt lake and i had a drop down and you know i did some you know which was fringe benefits like the some of the greatest fringe benefits of touring was getting to see this beautiful country and oh yeah me and you got to see some spots together the grand canyon Canyon. mesa verde all up and down the coast together and um i did that myself coming down um supposed to go from salt lake into los angeles and i was like Oh, Zion's right there. I'm going to go there. Yeah. And then, oh, you know, Grand Canyon's right there. Yeah. I'm going to go there. Yeah. And the first time I seen the Grand Canyon was by myself in a U-Haul. Yeah. And um, I, <laughs> I crept up in there. And I I, uh, I had some uh, hippie traveler friends when I was younger in college at Salisbury. And they were always like, you've never been to the Grand Canyon unless you go to the North Rim. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, what? What do you mean? And they're like, the South Rim's the one you always see. You know, the North Rim that's the cool spot like the hipster travel spot so i'm coming down from zion had no idea where i was going and i'm like see a sign that says grand canyon i'm like okay i'm going start driving and get down there ends up i'm driving down a 50 mile one-way road to what ends up being the north rim right so as i'm driving down there i have no place to stay you know i'm out here by myself first time ever like this far away from home by myself or anything yeah and um, coming up on, you know, every every time you get to one of those points, they have, like, the National Park Hotel that's overpriced, like, $500 a night or something like that. And I get there. I'm completely tired. I'm like, I'm going to wake up in the morning and see the Grand Canyon be so happy. And I was like, damn, where am I going to sleep? So I have this U-Haul. And luckily, we set it up that the bed was set up in the back in of the, the U-Haul. Garage. So I crawl in the back of the U-Haul and, like, you can't lock it or you're locked in, you yeah. know, like, type of thing. You can't even latch it or you're, yeah. like, locked in. So yeah. I had it, like, crept open a little bit. And, like, I'm in there for, like, two hours snoozing and I hear this noise, right? And um, <laughs> there's a light shining out there. And I'm like, oh, no, man, somebody's messing with me. Like, I jump up and I'm ready. It's and uh, and I hear, I didn't know yeah. if it was the cops. Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, <laughs> you know, I was like, man, somebody's yeah. coming to get me or something. Yeah. And uh, then I, I see the light go away, but I hear this car running next to me. And I was like, I need to get out of this U-Haul right now you know so i jump up out of you all and it was the security guys yeah. like listen man this is a really high-end hotel you can't sleep in the U-Haul <laughs> yeah. here. i said okay cool he goes listen go back down a half mile there's a campsite you could sleep there no yeah. problem in yeah. your u-haul nobody give you a hard time i get down there again alone in the middle of nowhere in arizona and um i start hearing the craziest animal noises i've yeah. ever heard it was, <laughs> the closest thing i could ever relate it to was um did you ever play Doom? Yeah. Like and you hear the yeah. demonic, mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. roars and grunts and everything oh, in the back. Nice, yeah. And I'm like, oh, my God, what is going on? Like, I have no idea. So, like, I'm in there, like, petrified, like, trying to sleep, can't sleep. And I start seeing the sun crack. And I'm still hearing these noises, like, straight hearing these noises. And then I start hearing people. And I'm like, okay, there's people out there. I can get out. And I jump out. And I'm like, oh, my God, what's going on? And I was parked right next to the donkey tank. <laughs> all right and if you've never heard a donkey which i've never heard before they, they sound, they sound like, like satan they, themselves <laughs> <laughs> so i oh, end shit. up i end up walking out and i'm like at the grand canyon i look where i peed the night before if i would have stepped five more feet i would have fell into the grand canyon <laughs> right and um i was on the north rim Jesus, and i was like scary. i was like this is pretty cool though yeah. so i'm out there on the north rim i had a grilled lincoln shirt on uh back then the you know the uh, album was wake up awesome mm-hmm. and then you know 
know, I got my picture. I did. I I woke up completely awesome. Like, you know, it was like one of the greatest memories I had. And then I started talking to people. I was like, where am I? And they're like, well, you're at the Grand Canyon. I was like, yeah, I know, but this doesn't look like what I'm thinking. And they're like, oh, you're on the North Rim. And I was like, oh, yeah, cool, cool. All right, well, how do you get to the South Rim? And they're like, oh, you just drive back out that 50-mile one-way road that you came in and just start circling around. And you go to the South Rim. You know, I was like, well, that's only like 10 miles over there. And they're like, yeah, you can't get there that way. It's five hours. That's when the whole magnitude of the West, yeah. like, set in, yeah. you know, like, really, like, you know, on that trip right there, that that first tour, um, you know, sightseeing and everything was great. I drove the uh, U-Haul over the uh, um, Hoover Dam at the time, you know, yeah, and nice. this was post 9-11, so I was kind of like, I can't believe they <laughs> let me drive this U-Haul <laughs> over the Hoover truck, Dam. Yeah, right. And um, you can't even do that now, actually. Yeah you, yeah, you can still drive over. But anyway, it gave me more of appreciation for the zest for touring and wanting to get the bands out there. And not not just to get the music out there, but to get our guys out there. Yeah. You know, like to see this country and experience it and live it. And like, you know, it's not a paid vacation, but it can be. You know, if you, if you absorb it that way, you can get a lot out of it type of thing. And... So long story short on that, I make it to Los Angeles, meet back up with um, the Grilled Lakens and uh, Bumpin' Uglies and went with them down into uh, Phoenix and Tucson and ended up flying out, you know, from there. And uh, that was really my, you know, first experience on the West Coast with a band. It was, you know, a great time. It was the first time any of our bands went, you know, to the West Coast. And um, since then, um, you know, if you combine our work with Pasadena, Bumpin' Uglies, Bond and Bentley, Wise Eyes, um, Morning Fatty, who was a great band out of uh, Florida, yeah, um, Resonated was another one, and I believe Oogie Wawa mm-hmm. was uh, was another one. Um, Love Betty had some stuff in there too, mm-hmm. and um, at one time or another, these folks, you know, were all clients, and um, I think we sent over twenty five full tours to the West Coast. Coast full national tours. That's crazy. Um, you know, bumping uglies in Pasadena. You know, now the Joey Harmon band. They were all you know ten each. You know that that did that. Bon and Bentley did it a couple times. All the other guys all did it at least once. Wise Eyes did it twice. Yeah. Morning Fatty, I believe, did it twice with us. Um, look back, and I remember February <coughs> two thousand fifteen, going into Frozen Harbor that year. Um, I had ten different national spring tours coming that time and it's impressive man. yeah it was a lot um 2015 was a personal banner year for me i booked um not all these shows were booked in 2015 but from you know january 1 to uh, december 31st i booked um 15 shows that year 1500 these aren't slots like these are 1500 Full individual shows, like band bookings multi-band shows. where i contacted the bar actually put those I mean, we're talking, court. where are we at? We're talking hundred thousand millions of dollars uh, in, in, <clears throat> in revenue that's spinning around and going into the hands of bands. When we, when we calculated it out, there were, I would say from 2014 until 2017, maybe not, maybe not 2018, into 2017, we were pushing 750000 to a million dollars in annual receipts of gross this is, that all, would, this is all people who are booking bands. Yeah. Right? So this is a, this is a million. We would count in our shows that we do at Soundstage and Ramshead so and yeah. stuff like that, which would be you know eight to ten thousand dollar gates. You know that would that would get thrown into there and added in too. But you know with. But the point is, is that this is money that's all filtering to musicians. Musicians, yeah. It is a million dollars. Yeah. I mean, I looked at you know Frozen Harbor the one time, and you know sat back and told Frank, I was like, you know, there's 100 plus bands. Let's just say there's five guys per band. We just employ 500 separate people at least yeah. for one for one day. Yeah. You know, and, you know, Not, I never really prided myself on that because I knew how little some of the guys in the bands played for, but at the same time, this is what they wanted to do, and, you know, with their lives, and we were able to help them with it. Like, we really were, like, put it forward and put some gas in the tank, put some mcdonald's in the van or you know get a hotel 100 you know get some money yeah. for the hotel or you know but all while these these guys were out expanding you know their careers and their music and you know entertaining bands all over the country but it it sucks that money has to come into play but 
you know what you're saying is, is true. Like we definitely generated a, a sub economy. It's in, it's important. Yeah. You, know, people, you, you can only you only have so many hours in the day, so much right. time. So you need mm-hmm. to be making money while right. you're at your show. Yeah. Um. So it is really important for keeping uh-huh. people on the road, keeping people, people together. Because like you said, we have car payments. Yeah. Some people have children. You know, some people have a lot of like um, financial responsibility, house payments, and all this stuff. Um. So, but let's. This is a good time to hit on this because what you were doing this mission that you guys were on is incredibly rare Mm -hmm. right to get bands basically from obscurity playing Mm -hmm. to open mics you know not not getting any traction to a place where you're you're building fan bases in multiple cities and you have that opportunity the only way to get it is to get in front of people even today with the internet um if you're gonna grow a rock band you need to get in front of people um so like i mean if you're a band right now yeah. trying to get from there to now yeah. and you're leaving, you're fucked. Yeah. yeah. There, I haven't in my 10 years, you know, I mean, I mean, really 20 years, like being very interested in the music business, but yeah. 10 years of actually professionally making a living at it. Mm-hmm. Um, I have not encountered another one coast. I have not encountered yeah. another pirate rock. They're There's all a... work. They're all trying to get at work at. A, a, a monetarily speaking, yeah, you know, a more lucrative level. Right. We we started from the ground up, just like any other band. We considered ourselves a DIY promotion company. We just considered ourselves a DIY booking agency. We were we were the same as you guys. We didn't know what we were doing. We were just trying to do it to the best of our ability, do it honestly and cleanly, and you know, scrape some money here and there. Um, when we started this, there wasn't options really for a lot of these bands to do what they were doing unless they did it themselves or they got picked up by some other agency that was almost like out of reach okay so when you guys are getting started we're talking about your your your, your CAA is William Morris, William Morris it, yeah I mean Endeavor it, now is your is your big one but right. I mean these are Paradigm and, yeah. and um, all those types of Mon- monster agencies right and, yeah and, and you need to get on the radar of those guys um, we, we yeah, had a little songs out and yeah, we had a little niche thing that, you know, um, I was basically, you know, a fifth member in one of these bands. Like, I was I was as invested as they were in certain aspects. Um, you know, I just happened to play the laptop and the telephone, you know, was, was my position. And we knew that with the way the music industry was, you kind of needed to show the bigger agencies that you were out there doing it. And if you weren't out there doing it, you know, they weren't really going to be interested in, and you know, what your main goal was that you wanted to build a national fan base and to be considered a national band. And, you know, back then, like, you know, everybody was always saying, like, to be considered a national band, you have to touch both coasts twice a year, you know, to truly be considered a national band. And that, you know, from 2012 on, you know, it's what we really, you know, tried to do, you know, as far as doing that and um, working in, in that direction. And unless you, Zach, were, like, booking everything yourself and doing that or you were with a higher agency there wasn't anybody else other really than one coast especially in this area that was going to be able to do that for you there was some other spot stuff across the country but looking back that long ago there was nobody good or there was nobody doing it there's nobody yet efficient at it now there are some companies that started around 2011 and 12 and that like nimble slick and empire those guys are doing great they they far surpassed anything that one coast is doing mm-hmm. But, um, you know, at that time when we were steadily doing it, there was local guys and big, big national guys, you know. So the local guys were good, and what we would do is try to network with them when we got local. But there wasn't really anybody else, like, pushing. pushing that gap. Yeah, pushing yeah. the bands out there. And, you know, it was a big deal if your Florida band, you know, came up and played in New York. Sure. It was a big deal if your New York band went down and played Florida. Sure. But to start getting bands, you know, from the East Coast out to the West Coast, it happened a lot more in reverse. The West Coast bands came to the East Coast, and it always kind of seems like that because it was the hub of you know certain genres like you know reggae and stuff. Sure. And um, but to get the East Coast back out there was a lot more rare, and there wasn't necessarily a lot of people doing it, especially doing you know forty five day tours and, mm-hmm. and stuff like that. You know back and forth. Um, so uh, right after uh, June that year, we in two thousand twelve we planned another one, which. Um, was you know one of my you know favorite experiences ever it was bumping uglies in pasadena and it was uh the nowhere fast tour that was a, it was a co-headline tour for the most part um but it was under pasadena's eminem name that came out that year 
and we actually did all four corners of the United States. We did 42 shows in 45 days. Nine people in a row. Now, looking back on that, none of those guys would ever do that again in their lives. <laughs> none of those guys would ever put that many people in a van. None of them would ever do that many shows, and you know, none of them would do it for that cheap. Mm -hmm. But we did it, and you know, we. We played all those shows, made it across the country. Some of them were great, some of them were bad. You know, like I think like we would keep score. You know, like you know, football games or something. Yeah. And um, you know, we had forty-two shows or whatever. And uh, I think we decided at the end we were thirty-eight-four. You know, okay. so like having some guy. You know, there was you know four bums. That's, you know, like four bad shows. You know, amazing. But you know, we would count wins as different things. You know, like hey man, we had a good night. This was a new town. Like twenty people came to see us. That was awesome. That was massive. Awesome. Back massive, then, yeah. you know, like. And it's, it's still a win these days, you know, for, you know, you're out there and you're first time in Boise, Idaho, and, you know, you set the show up and, you know, you have 20 internet fans and they showed up to see you and, you know, that's, that's what it was all about. But getting back into what you said, like, with the music industry now, um, you know, getting out there and putting the music in front of the people and building fans, we used to call it planting seeds. Mm -hmm. So we'd go to these new towns and, you know, like, Oh, well, we'd be terrible in Boise, Idaho. Why are we going to go there? It's like, because you will always be terrible there you go. until you go there and play. Plan a seat. Make five awesome fans. Yeah. Make one awesome the fan. The bartender. Leave CDs. Yeah. Leave merch. Yeah. Leave anything. But most importantly, leave a good impression. Okay. Yeah, play a good show. When you come back, people would have seen your internet stuff by then. They would have heard of your friends talking about it. And then you come back, maybe, their friends on it, yeah. maybe you only have 15 people that time. But, you know, things grow exponentially. Bumpin' Uglies are touring around the country right now, killing it. And, killing it. You know, they are, you know, they might have taken the hard path of doing some things, but, you know, what they did worked, you know, and it, like, you know, maybe there could have been some things that happened faster or different, but we were all in a learning process, and, uh, you know, it was all something that we were all figuring out together. And um, with the state of the music industry these days, like, the record labels, you know, with records not being as profitable, unless, you know, they're big hits, and, you know, pop stuff that's on the radio all the time and club bangers and all that stuff. You know, they're not throwing out record label money until you prove to them that you already have a following. Mm -hmm. um, back in the 70s and stuff like that, they didn't want you to have a following. They didn't want anybody to even know who you were. Like, yeah. They wanted you to, you know, all of a sudden, like, oh, my God, here's the best new thing that's ever yeah. come out. It's Zap Palace and the Company Band, yeah. and you're going to hear it on the radio 40 times a week because we're going to shove it down your throat, sure. <laughs> and it's going to be the coolest thing you've ever seen. Yeah. But they didn't want you. They didn't want people to know you before that. Right. Now it's reversed. They want everyone to know you sure. before they roll the dice on you and take a chance and, and build you up. And, you know, uh, it's the algorithms now. It's like yeah. literally the mm -hmm. computers are picking bands like this one will be a success. Yeah, and the more you tour, the more marketing you get for your own name in front of people live, the more marketing you get from your people as far as talking about it after the show, during the show, leading up to the show. Like all that stuff builds in, you know, to touring. You know, even if you look at, you know, in the 80s or even now, like, big name bands still make their bread and butter off oh, touring. Yeah, you, know, like, yeah. you know, you don't make a lot of money off the records. You don't make a lot of money off Spotify. You make some, you know, but, like, playing live shows like traditionally. Sure, you know, way, yeah. yeah, but we never did touring to make money. Touring was always, like, a starvation thing. Like, you know, I almost you know, equated it to being, like, out on a mission of some sort, you know, like, you're out there, you know, don't starve, don't die, you know, make sure you have shelter and everything, but, you know, we were on a mission to really everybody get their music out there and, you know, do something, something unique, something different, um, I'll tell you, it was a lot of work for me, um, you know, people might not believe it, people might not accept it, but, you know, but at times, um, most of the time when I was tour booking, you know, it's a 10 to 14 hour a day thing, and, you know, it might not be every day, but when it is, like, you get into it and you do it. And, you know, on my end, as, you know, as far as uh, what I did, I actually did the first, you know, maybe eight to 12 national tours that I ever booked, I did completely for free. Mm -hmm. And I did that as an investment to the bands. Um, you know, I probably would have went along with Pasadena, uh, Bumpin' Uglies, and Bonnie Bentley. And originally, we had a deal that if the band doesn't average $300 a night, then I don't make anything. And we weren't averaging that, you know, so a lot of this stuff I just did for love, you know, um, hopes, you know, to that the bands, yeah, that it would grow into something. Yeah. And, uh, and it did in a lot yeah, of cases. Yeah, it, it yeah. did in a lot of cases, and, 
you know, we all grew out of the situation that the bands weren't making three hundred dollars a night, right. you know, that they were, you know, and then it became profitable, and then it was nice for me too, you know, because I get a whole bunch of chunk of shows, like you know, but it wasn't anything any of us really ever did for profit, you know. Well, you're not getting rich. You know? hopes there's, of, no, there's no like a hopes of long term fame and getting rich, you know, maybe, but yeah. not, you know, it's like, hey, we're not going out on tour. People will be like, oh, you're going out on tour, man. You're gonna come back stacked with cash, like. No, we're gonna be lucky to come back like nourished. <laughs> yeah, alive. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was uh, it was definitely a lot of work. It was definitely very time consuming. It had strains on a lot of the friendships that I had, relationships that I had. Um, you know, just time that I sat in front of a computer and just worked and worked and worked. And um, you know, girlfriends love that. Yeah, they, they, they do. do it's, that, yeah. I mean, I, 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 I've never, I, I don't think there's another man in the world that has made girlfriends as jealous of computers. As I have. You know, like just blatantly, like, like Steve Jobs, like you know, jealous, Gates, Rob Bryan. jealous of computers. <laughs> like, um, yeah. You know, uh, you know yeah. luckily I have a very understanding, you know, great wife now, Catherine, yeah. you know, um, and who, I met, who I met, yeah, and my yeah. lovely daughter, Thea, who just came around this year too. Mm-hmm. Um, but, um, you know, she understood from day one. She was like, I know, you know, she's like, the problem is like when people looked at it as a hobby, even my mother for years was like, what are you doing? You're playing games. It's a hobby. Sure. You know, it's something that you're doing. And, and they didn't get it, you know, type of thing. And uh, it's hard for someone to accept that that is actually a job. Like when you're sitting at home on your own couch with Sports Center on and you're on your laptop 10 hours a day, like you're not working. Yes, yeah. I am definitely He's not working. building a roof right I now, but definitely I'm working. working. Yeah. And you know what? I would rather build a roof. <laughs> <laughs> um, one, of the, one of the really great things, uh, you know, we talked about just like the band kind of moving to South Africa, leaving home then and then doing more stuff. Um, touring really, you know, brought us to a lot of cool people across the country um one of the first places that you know made touring in colorado possible for a long period of time you know great friends out there kirk and al smith yeah um you know ben tony you know that was out there um those guys all helped us develop you know a little scene and you know grow our fans um it was a great spring for me you know across the country of course and then but what was even better is we started developing you know these little pockets of fans but you know they really become friends and family and yeah. you know um kurt and his wife you know came over here a couple times you know to see if i could uh, stay at my house over here in windsor and chapel hill um they come to play the armory um and these places these towns popped up all over the place um you know we had little niche places in um you know we started with our friends uh you know bear and jake who you know just went out here and uh, talked in uh, pueblo, pueblo Co- yeah pueblo colorado that was one of the first ones um we had uh, Lauren and Kathy and our friend Derbs and AJ all out in Tahoe. Oh, that was awesome. awesome. You know, like when I went out to, uh, you know, I went out for like 45 days like uh, in that capacity. You know, I flew to Wawa and Wise Eyes and all the while we're out on tour in California. And then I went out to Tahoe four different times out there in three and a half days. And, you know, those folks just not only, you know, they did some care, they really, you know, put you up to like some fancy trips. But like, they were very kind. Like these people became like your really good friends and, you know, Yes, they didn't want to hang out, but I mean the whole, you know, the whole Sacramento, you know, down to uh, you know Santa Cruz family with uh, Art of Heart Roots, you know, like all those guys, Josh Nickel, you know, Tyler, Spencer, Nick, Dan Nickel, they were all great guys, you know, like it was just something that we really developed. Um, you had your friends down in San Diego who stayed with. Mm-hmm. I wasn't really as close with them, but like the same thing, you know, like you need that. You need yeah. that. You need it. I don't think people appreciate that. <clears throat> It's not just a booking agent, a manager, and a band, yeah. and, and and fans. It's like a, a support system. Yeah, it really like was like real. I always joked about touring. Um, everybody is like, "How do you do it? How do you stay into it?" I was like, "I treat it in my head as a role playing like world conqueror." Yeah. <laughs> and like my band is a little army. And <laughs> yeah. I, I got to send it out there, and Zach's the general of that band, and I got to make sure Zach's getting enough supplies and support and money yeah. and shelter and food and everything to take over. You know, city by city for the ground score movement. You There's know? hundreds of people that did. And we hundreds met, of people. We met for a small so band. many great people. Uh, um, uh, Austin, Texas, we had great crew of people. You know, one of our friends, Doug, moved out there. Um, you know, he was always taking care of us. Um, we have Jason and Rachel Otto up in uh, Oregon, you know, who are part of the Arkansas Park Roots crew. They stayed with us there. Um, everybody, you know, 
Yeah, probably leaving a lot of people Everybody, out. Everybody, so we're leaving out, so don't get offended. We're leaving you out right now. You know, everybody, everybody. We love you all, and it does, again, it does take a ton to be friends with your people, yeah. to feed you, you know, to whole, push you up, yeah. to come to shows, to tell their friends, to mm-hmm. make stickers, to like make flyers, even. Yeah, the whole whole state of Florida, Kevin Owens, uh, yeah, um, Diva down in uh, you know West Palm. She was down there. Sam owns Strata Dub in West yeah. Palm. Uh, Demetrius over in uh, from Ocean Stone over. Tampa Bay, uh, so he, uh, your boy Gabe, we, yeah. we, we, we went down, what was that, Gabe yeah. Coral, yeah. you know, we went down there, yeah. um, worked it back up the East Coast with, uh, you know, everybody we had, you know, Beauregard and mm-hmm. Hannah, his whole crew, um, Ramses and Flame and Raleigh, yeah, you know, how could we, how many know, bands have they put They've housed, they've housed everybody, everybody, you know, Matt, Matt Bone and Frankie Hundreds Goodrich and everybody yeah. in Raleigh, you know, yeah. everything too, yeah. and, um, you know, but one, one place has always stood out. What place was that, Zach? Yeah. You know it, Buffalo, man. New York. Buffalo, Buffalo, New York. Uh, Buffalo yeah. was always our home away from home, man. It was. Uh, if you'd asked me ten years ago, you're like, <clears throat> yeah, hey, who, here's a market you're going to do G and Good in, like Buffalo. It's like, like, why are we? You okay. know, why are we doing Buffalo? Sure. So, uh, Buffalo's been great, man. Um, it really is. Uh, you know, Baltimore's home away from home for yeah. a lot of us. Uh, the music really just caught on up there. Um, it comes from a really crazy story, and uh, the story originated with a couple guys from that had ties with Buffalo, Baltimore, and St. Paul, New Jersey. Mm-hmm. Okay, and um, our boy Ben Sensi was in town from Norway. We set up a couple shows for us too. We were in Albert Hall, you know, that was like that. We had a before we forget to, we had a whole Indianapolis crew with uh, with Seth, Seth, yeah. Shelby, mm-hmm. and Hannah, and everything. You know, those guys were great too. We don't want to forget you out there but talk about the story with buffalo um ben and a couple of these other kids um uh rob Jadinsky, i mm-hmm. believe he's from up in uh, buffalo and um one of our other boys from here in, uh, in baltimore they went on a semester abroad cruise okay and the story that i heard is that they were all packed and ready to go and everybody got on a boat and they just really freaking came from packed music and um uh, the Sick and Tired album by Pasadena was, <laughs> got played over was over. one of the only albums <laughs> on the boat while they were nice. out there. Yeah. And um, it really got passed around and built up. And, you know, then Pasadena, not really me, even as a booking agent, because it was actually started a little bit before I got involved too much. Like, I went up to Buffalo with them maybe the second or third time I went up there. But um, they everybody just loved Pasadena from us. So we get up to Buffalo the first time I go up. We were on a part of a run from State College and went up to Buffalo. I didn't know what to expect. And even after the first time, I didn't really know what to expect. You know, like we played Michi's downtown. We stayed at um, some friend's uh, apartment. Um, the night was a little blurry. My first time there, I didn't, lot. didn't know who was there, who yeah. wasn't going to be there. Yeah. Um, but uh, we start working with uh, a lot of people in the South Towns and like the, you know, understand the North Towns, but Buffalo proper. And then, you know, you get down into South Towns like Lakewood Park sure. and um, met the folks that own the Wheels, um, Rick and uh, his, his wife, uh, what is it? I forget. But anyway. Right down by the stadium. <laughs> yeah, right by right the stadium, O'Neill stadium, stadium Inn. And um, yeah. we start inviting our bands up there, Abe Wicker and his brother Danny Wicker, yeah. we're uh, family with them, uh, big fans of Pasadena. And sure. things just took off from there. Like, I mean, we would go up there you know, once every three months, something like that, have a show there. They would always take care of us there. We would go play another little venue here while we were up there, you know, turn into a three-day weekend, play down at uh, Sunset Bay. Um, We'd play out at the bar, the beach bar out there, Sunset Bay Beach Bar. Um, Um, What was that tour? It was Pasadena, Bill Minton, Sound School, and Rachel Platt. Yeah, Rachel Platt. Yeah, we actually took her up there. She played with us up there. Rachel played at my birthday party. (laughs) Like, how how crazy ironic is that? That was you a know, great 2011. one. I remember we because we did that one and uh, we booked Pasadena was headlining and then obviously Bill Lincoln, yeah. uh-huh. and so it was like it was going to be like Brown Score or Rachel Platt. Yeah, like which one? Uh-huh. And like we didn't really care. Yeah, um, and I forget which way it went. I think I think so. Like the first night, I think they liked it, uh-huh. right? And then the next day, they were like, "Hey, we want Lincoln from Nashville." Yeah, and we were like, "Okay, like okay, okay." And so like we came out and just like. Dr- like just were like <laughs> loud and like nauseous and just like really high energy, like yeah. super high energy. And then she came out and there was even more like like yeah. pop in the air. But uh-huh. then you know 
know, and like, God bless Rachel, she's fucking awesome. Amazing, Amazing. like, congratulations to her. But, like, but it was funny after career. that, because like, the bar is just like, live, like, the yeah. energy is crazy, <laughs> and she's like, trying to get like, her message across, and so then she, she comes up right after like, their set, and she's like, hey, we'll go for a scene now, it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> like, yes. <laughs> she was, uh, you know, amazing person to work with. Oh, and, dude, um, true, real talent. And they were just, like, sweet. Dude. Yeah. It's, like, super sweet. But, you, you know, there was a lot of, you know, across the board from Buffalo developed um, some some real things, and, you know, so had some regular bar gigs, um, you know, that we were, you know, taking care of really well um, up into, you know, um, Pasadena and Bump and Uglies playing, you know, owning the Baltimore Iron Bar pretty much. Like, you know, this is eight hours away. And, yeah. Um, it's a regular situation where these guys are going and they're just owning shows and then there's so many people that go you know to support it and that's sweet you know we gotta give a shout out to our boy Corey Gebler mm -hmm. gotta give yeah. a shout out to uh um Ryan Spaulding Joe McCraw Ian Walsh uh Nick Hodson I mean I John think Hodson, I, mean, yeah, Nick, I think I Nick think we Hodson. have I think we have how many pictures of uh videos of, of Mr. Hodson uh singing shirtless in the back of everybody's uh in the back of everybody's songs, going, uh, going balls deep, man. You know, yeah, Danny, yeah. Danny Name Liquor again, uh, Polly yeah. Sims, uh, yeah. Brian Sitkowski, um, uh, Adam Cable. You know, all these kids, guys, you know, were huge supporters of what we had going on. I, I can't forget, um, you know, Shayna, mm -hmm. her sister Shana. Stacy yeah. Bookhagen, and, and Mark Bookhagen, um, Jay Schneckenberger. Um, you know, all these guys were really good, and ladies, you know, all really, you know, flew us out there. Um, and supported everything that we did up there and just made it so easy and welcoming to to come back even when shows were going through you know s snow with the dress that was Dude, amazing that everything was, yeah really um, good good people we caught a good buzz like you know it was uh you know maybe an after effect or whatever of what our bands were doing but you know um it was it was just a good thing that we like one place was very receptive up there as well we did some other shows up there we did like a wax show up there you know so that was huge up there a lot of the newer bands that weren't even necessarily a part of the first Nick or anything up there joining Operation Sex and Dream Experiences up there going up with you know the newer you know guys that we were working with along the network and stuff like that um, you know had some good experiences up there and you know not only did these folks appreciate what we did up there and you know they were a big part of what we did here but came down and you know supported what we did at the Trojan Harbor Pirate Rock and Birthday Bash Jam for Dam. I mean, a bunch of them even came out to the Fallout Festival that we had, yeah. you know, which was in Weatherly again, and it happened to be, uh, you know, about 18 degrees all weekend. Everybody yeah. froze their butts which off, but cool. that's long for that. You know, yeah. but we still, we, you know, we still had a good time. So, like, you know, all the friends and family, you know, across the country that we've made, you know, my life is ultimately enriched, you know, from from knowing these people and meeting these people and the experiences that we've shared. Um, one of the biggest things. Possibly time touring, you know. Um, you know, I expect to hope, you know, to go visit a lot of these folks in places on, on my own, you know, outside of the music business and everything that's happening now. But, you know, really, you know, one of the most rewarding things, you know, is you know, the relationships you develop with a lot of these people and everything. Again, especially Buffalo. You know, like you said earlier, um, and I'm glad that you brought it up because it was a really big part of your guys' kind of vibe was the have a family aspect. Yeah. It wasn't a business thing. Mm -hmm. It was like we're a family and we look out for each other. And like definitely like I mean Joey gets a lot of credit for it. Yeah. Uh, so the whole Pasadena he's, crew knows. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. um but but jo Joey in particular is uh, you know he's one of these little brothers. Yeah. Right? Like the yeah. the cousin. Great guy. Yeah. Oh hell yeah. 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 So he 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 was a he was a, a very instrumental in, in making it feel that way. But all you guys were. Well, all you guys I, were uh, like very much like this is a family. We go back to. Uh, I'd say it was summer of 2007 was the first time we worked with Pasadena and went on to that Exorcist Nine Inch Drummer Chisels. And uh, Crazy Eddie, again, was like, he knew my philosophy. He knew about working together. He knew I wanted to start a band. He knew he knew I wanted everybody to get along. It was cooperation, not competition. And he said, fuck, man, these guys in Pasadena, you, you have to learn to be friends with them. These are guys that you have to bring into your band. Your vibe really, like, really has to, uh, you know, you know, you guys have to get together. And I said, well, why? What's up? He goes, Rob, I don't know how else to explain it. They're a band gang. Yeah. And I'm like, what? He's like, a band gang. He's yeah. like, there's like four or five bands, and they all just like roll together. Yeah. And like, you know, they want to do shows together, and they want to do this and that. And he's like, it's exactly like what you want to do. Yeah. So, um, you know, moving into, you know, some of the bands that we worked with, you know, let's, you know, touch on Pasadena again. I, I have, you know, none of this. If it wasn't for Joey, you know, accepting me and inviting me up here, um, Ray, Bonnie Hendrick, Lee Lee, and, and Herb Lee, and all 
other stuff. Um, Grill Bacon is doing so well at work and everything when I drive up here and come to these shows. And everybody just wanted the same thing. We want a cool day. We want a cool vibe. We want cool fun. This is what these guys did for fun, but it was also their job. So, like, let's make it as fun as possible while we're doing it. And obviously, Pasadena already has a lot of stuff going on. They've got a family going on. They've got a song called Family. They've had a family. They've got 300 people, you know, a night going out to their shows. Like, you know, we throw steak circus all over them, you know, but it is something that, you know, we spun into, you know, and um, Pasadena is a lot like, you know, great times with all those guys, you know, like closing down the 1400 person night at Ram's Head, um, opening for Sublime at the pier, yeah. opening for Sublime again, going on the Blah Blah Molly tour, mm-hmm. experiencing so many things like that one tour that we went on together, we did like, you were with us, we did like Mesa Verde together, we did the Grand Canyon together, you know, we did Las Vegas so together, yeah, like, Vegas, yeah. just so much cool so stuff, much just, um, you know, some great guys, uh, Will Finley, Tory Street, yeah. Aaron Cooper, Matt Ritchie, mm-hmm. you know, just some, some stuff like you got, you know, there's ups and downs with everybody, but you know, you just look back at all those times and be like very appreciative. Um, Tom Mapateer Tom, coming in Roger, like later, you yeah. coming in. Yeah. Oh, we ain't gonna talk about Roger. Yeah. Yeah. No, we don't have to talk about Roger. Well, Jake will not. <laughs> <laughs> I have a, uh, I have very few. I was just trying to remember Miss Sarah. Let's throw Miss Sarah in there. Too. Obviously, Miss so Sarah and, and, yeah. and Miss Sarah's, uh, Miss Sarah's parents, Mike and Lenny. It's just some of the greatest people yeah, I've ever met. Great supporters again. You know, like that tie in. Um, you know, just had you know a lot of thanks to working with those guys, a lot of great experiences. Um, without them, I wouldn't have the opportunity that I had, you know, could be said vice versa between the two. But um, another one was, uh, you know, Bond and Bentley, you know, when those guys got in, you know, it was, they were actually our first client. One Coast's first clients were Bond and Bentley, you know, wrote and said, listen, I want you guys, you guys know what you're doing. It's, you know, I want you guys to work with us. Glad we jumped on soon after. Grill Blinkens were all, already involved. Um, you know, working with us, you know, at that point, too. And then uh, eventually we had Bump Nuggles, you know, who came in, too. And um, just great experiences with everybody across the board. Um, you know, I wish nothing, you know, from the beginning but success for these guys. A lot of my motivation was just, you know, to push these folks forward, work with them, you know, do what they can to have the most economic amount of opportunity to work with all these great people. But really just saw them. stopped and ran up these tracks like on the whole groundswell the first time he's like this is what i'm looking for like yeah. you know you guys are all doing this and this this is awesome you know and it was something there i was like i actually had this whole kind of seattle analogy you know in my in my head and you know he's this band was this and this band was this but i was like man you know if something could have snuck under their throat when they ran for groundswell i was like these guys have the potential to be on the main uh the seattle scene you know what i mean and it worked for the baltimore thing because you guys had the punk, you had the rock, like you could cross it down into reggae sometimes too, and you kind of just the performers, you know, like you put it forward and really put it out there. Um, you know, got Joey and Brandon and Ray and Gritty and Rocky, all those next and songwriters, yeah. everybody. You know, we live in such a great community of like artists that have so much talent. It's just like I can't say enough about like you know really everybody. You yeah, know, it's yeah, just, you wouldn't expect them to have anything. So we talk about it all the time. Yeah. It's just like it's yeah. just a walk of talent. It's, it's amazing. I I don't know where it comes from, where the, where the feed is. Sometimes, you know, they say that, you know, our, you know, artistic greatness comes from the plight, you know, and, you know, there's a lot of that in Baltimore, you know, it's in these hard times, um, you know, a lot of blue collar jobs being lost, kids that were supposed to grow up into these things, you know, were left to not do those things or creative reasons and other reasons, like, you know, put them behind it. And, you know, there's a lot of different things you could look at too, like, you know, like, when some guys like, uh, you know, maybe Citizen Cope or Good Charlotte or something break, there's some inspiration in some of those new Maryland guys, too. I know, like, Bally Hughes only a couple of years ahead of Pasadena and Bump Nuggles, but a tremendous influence and yeah. like inspiration of, like, hey, you guys can go out and do this. You can do it, too. Like, it can become a career even if you're not, like, the famous, huge right, rock star. Right, yeah. You could still do this, yeah. you know, and, you know, working with all those guys just – Man, really great experiences. Like, you know, thanks to all you guys. Like, I've really, you know, I wouldn't have been able to have the career I have if it wasn't working with all you guys. And, you know, if I I didn't name any bands, but like, <laughs> it doesn't mean that, you know, you're any less. I, I've really had, you know, a lot of great times with, with everybody. Um, one band I do want to shout out to is uh, Love Betty. Uh, shout out to Chuck Gates, CP Fields, yeah. and uh, his wife, Allie Maples. Um, they, you know.
know, came along and just fit in. You know, we were part of Wonko since 2011, and um, they introduced all of us to Austin, which is South by Southwest. Um, one thing that we always talked about, um, Lauren and I, and she's like, you can just go and rent a room down in Austin and host your own shows. And so I was like, okay, you know, like South by Southwest, like this big overwhelming thing. And yeah. um, we got down there to one year and we applied for all the normal ones. We did Gorilla Red Gorilla, part of Texas Rock Fest, and did all those, you know, and had, you know, some things going. Um, but the next year we got our own. And just like with touring or jam to jam, we start getting notice that we were doing got to the height of it um we were hosting our own show at the lodge on sixth um and i think 2013 was the biggest was the year i think it was 13 was the biggest year that we ever had um we had our own flyers mm-hmm. one coast had their own flyer for all the showcases one coast was doing and we had 66 band notices that year at south by southwest with ooh you wah wah love betty bonnie bentley jack bellis yeah. pasadena bump and ugly Roots came down, yeah. Kurt Sokol was there, mm-hmm. but like we, Wise Eyes was there. You know, we had our, all our, we had a flyer worth of our own stuff. You know, yeah. like sixty six times our guys played, which you know was all things I, I was looking. You know, and um, you know it all came from Chuck and Allie uh, from Love Betty. You know, they they showed us the ropes down there, and we kind of you know expanded on it. Um, the last year we were down there at the Lodge was uh, like two thousand sixteen. Frank was down there with me, uh, Frank Lewis, and uh, we had went down and we did five days, ten bands a day, Um, you know, so we were really making advantage of it, and it was something that, you know, eventually we got away from, Um, I don't think it was, I don't think South by Southwest is what it used to be for the bands, I think it's fun to go, I don't think it's necessary for your career, Um, and we felt like we were becoming a part of the machine that I didn't like, which was doing some bands for weekends and totally wasting my bands time which is something we never wanted to do, which was why we stepped away from doing what we were doing in Austin, South by Southwest. You know, it was a, it's fun to go do. It's a great musical vacation experience. If you go down there with your, if you go down there and you're connected right with everything, but, um, you know, I'd be, it's not what it was 10 years ago. Yeah. But I'd be amiss to not, you know, touch on the Austin aspect of it a little bit. It was a really big thing that got us noticed. Mm -hmm. It got some of our bands noticed because of what, of us getting noticed like we were getting calls from people all over the country submission sites you know to come to play our shows and everything like that so it was a really good experience you know to go down there and do it and um it was a great time for us you mentioned you know being called that um let's talk about what's some of the things that in the last 18 years you did I always wish some of the guys, you know, doing their shit in Bump and Ugly would be out in front right now, really, you know, doing doing their thing in the reggae scene and, you know, heading it up. But I just, you know, I hope for bigger, grander things for all the bands. I, I wish that we all could have got there and just boys like Alan and Brock could, you know, we're out in Los Angeles all together and just chilling, homies, by the pool. And, like, you know, you know, the talent is getting recognized, but not necessarily the money and the fun and the partying that you see out here, that the talent is getting recognized. You know, I wish that we would have been able to, um, you know, push some bands over the top a little bit more. I wish there were some things that, that we could have done, you know, differently that would have made some differences in other people's career. I mean, I think we have great influences on what we did for people, but I just wish there was something more that we could have just been like, boom, hit that guy up there. Because, you know, really in this industry, I think it's like, you know, you and Alan, you know, I mean, I think, you know, getting just one of our guys in there would have had a little more of a push. So. You know, it's still a possibility that Bump and Ugly is still up and kicking. I think it's still a possibility. I think there's enough talent there. There's still great new scene, a bunch of great new talent coming up. You know, we're still doing their thing, too. It's like that was, you know, always the goal. I kind of just, you know, wish we could have got somebody in there. Um, looking back on some other things, I would have, you know, taken some things a lot more seriously as far as me being professional. Um, we, you know, we work on band shows a lot, you know, more than – burned on that having contracts you know it's something that at this level do you do a contract do you don't do a contract you know but you know when you're talking about shows that are 12 to 15 hundred dollars you know it's just something that 
what does that contract look like? Do they usually present a small claim state in that case and say, hey, we're going to use this pay, but, you know, there were some more professional aspects that we, we could have looked at things. Um, I wish I would have pursued, you know, some of the things on the industry side a little bit more as far as things like that, um, as far as what the publisher is publishing and not publishing the deeds and things are all listed especially legally just so that you know have that video witness in that case and things like that but you know there's all um sitting back and enjoying the time enjoying what you were doing that um really let me sink in that <clears throat> this might never happen again you know those kind of things and it's definitely something that you know i miss um you know and, and looking back on it and you know that's something that i definitely miss as well um could be said that you know and i i have some aspects too that i can look at it and say that you know less could have been more um i was always you know over did it instead of you know didn't really have the opportunity to live off the ball like i did have back in california you know and and there's something to be said about living off the ball every day and i think that maybe pulling back and not working the five hour days maybe would have been more free you know <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> like, but no, but like, seriously, yeah. like working the three and really and, devoting your efforts and really devoting my efforts to certain different things and finding other revenue stream streams for that band, making sure they're on the cover of every single song, you know, making making sure the publishing is just impeccable. And, you know, those are those are all different things. But like I said, we we even as musicians, we want to work off the one ten thousand dollar bill and be able to get ten grand a month out of that bill. And you know, the quantity was. There's also like you don't throw one seed of grass in one yard. No. You know, yeah. like so like my idea of more was just selling. You know, it's like you know, let's just try to get it out there and try to, you know, get people to you know, to to see what was up. Um you know, some uh What about um what's something that like surprised you? Like or like maybe like a lesson that you learned or something that maybe halfway through or towards the end of your career I didn't really expect that in a good way or a bad way. Like what's, what's something that surprised you that wasn't anticipated? Um, it's a, it's definitely a bad way. And I, you know, I don't want to be a naysayer or a naysayer, but it definitely felt like no matter what first class seat I felt like in, you know, in my mind was smashing on the top of that. And, you know, I, I felt like I either have to play ball with the way they want me to play ball and, you know, they being the overall, you know, but I really thought with the internet and everything like that, it could kind of supersede that. But unless you're really doing a lot on the internet, you're really just blowing up, you're going viral all the time or something like that, there still is a network of, I don't know you, and I'm not going to know who you are. And whether it be management companies that only put on their clients on your clients' tours, or this agency works with this management company and you're never going to get on tour with that band because you're not connected to that agency. You're not going to sneak in the back door no matter how good you are. Um, it kind of stinks. You know, like, it's a really frustrating situation of, you know, looking at that, looking at things that way. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, it was definitely... I always believed that we could just get through it. There was no route through it. And, you know, I'm not saying that you can't because we did, you know, as, as much as I would have liked to. But what we did, we did. You know, we did well. You know, we did a lot of it. And it, it changed a lot of people's lives for good and bad and whatever. Um, stirred up a lot of economy, just like we talked about. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, it gave a lot of people strength. Put a lot of people out there that wouldn't have, that wouldn't have had the motivation to do it themselves. Yeah. Um, what's, what's one or more things uh, that you're not going to miss? Um <laughs> <laughs> Two AM phone calls from yeah. either the venue or, or the the musicians. <laughs> Tell me more. Um, Tell me more of your major road rage stories. Tell me more about broken that. contracts, bad promises. Uh, What's up with the Two AM phone calls? Oh, uh, you know what are they? What are they calling the to band, talk about? The band stopped early, Rob. We were paying them too much money, and uh, yeah. you know, or hey, this show was terrible. Why'd you book it? I'm never playing Columbia again in my life. <laughs> South Carolina is uh, terrible. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know those things, but it comes with the territory. I mean, I I probably made my own two AM phone calls. Um, yeah, you know, really at the end of the day, one of the things was I always thought I was trying to help, and or 
is, you know, there's a little bit of letdown sometimes in, in the industry. Just like, am I a paid employee yet, or am I an underpaid employee? Has everything else been a problem? And it just seems, you know, it's it's real easy to overlook things and, and be unhappy about where I am instead of happy about where I am. You know, type of thing. And you know, I signed myself up for that. You know, I knew what it was. There's a lot of different personalities and other things you got going on in this business, and everybody's chasing their dreams. And you know, a lot of those things are just frustration. And you know, um, things don't go right. People drink too much, drink a couple of beers, get that two a.m. phone call. Yeah. And, you know, it came from everybody, and I've made them myself. And you know, um, random things you know just pop up the next day, and you're like, you know, somebody's mad at you about something that's the dumbest thing in the world. Like, oh, uh, you know, we get. We were supposed to get this beer in our green room, and we got Where's this beer. Where's my hummus? And, yeah. Where's my fucking hummus? <laughs> well, you know, we dealt with some of those things, too, working with nationals on, you know, Frozen Harbor and stuff. Yeah. And that's something we didn't talk about yet, which is, you know, a big part of the whole cruise that we got we to gotta touch base on is Frozen Harbor. Yeah. Um, What's that? It grew out of, uh, you know, the birthday bash, and it kind of was the culmination of, like, everything we did there and lock stock down in Kansas City with the multi stages yeah. um we got the idea from uh, a team down in austin you know from south by southwest and they were watching the boat down there on the cruise yeah and we started to notice that in the fire rock shows they had you know when i say we this is from frank but yeah frank lewis came in you know to the company in 2013 and did a lot of you know everything together since then um and uh, he was a big part you know of getting frozen harbor off the ground and what we wanted to do make a South by Southwest in Baltimore. And we started to notice that, you know, there's a birthday bash there that's coming in with a, um, popular, uh, a, event. a destination. Yeah. People would come. People would come up from out of town. Yeah, from out of town, like, um, 2012. You know, it wasn't the biggest show. There was still over a thousand people. But, um, we had people from 22 states come to that show because it became known almost like a one-day culture. Yeah. You know, they were like, yo, you're here instead of waiting for all my favorite bands to come to Buffalo or waiting for all my favorite bands to come to Omaha, I'm going to come there and see them all on the same night. And uh, so 2013, we expanded the birthday bash into two nights. And it wasn't the greatest idea, you know, but it was a test run to see what we could do. And um, it still went well. We had 900 people one night, and then the next night on the Sunday, we had 700 people coming back. So it was still two pretty big shows. Um, And then we approached Power Plant. said we want to do this and you know our buddy Drew Valdez you know rest in peace Mr. Man um, he was on our side Mark Mangold was on our crew was there Jimmy Murphy was on the bill at the time or uh, Booker Murphy had been on the bill at the time and Mark Mangold was before that and then we go to uh, the uh, general manager position or sorry the booking manager position live talent guy and um, he sat with us and we, we talked to uh, Chris about doing these things with the power plant and he's like you know if you want to put On a much smaller scale, obviously, but this started, you know, so we pushed it in 2013, and um, first year, I think it was 60 bands, um, one full day of Frozen Harbor, and then we had a bonus day party, free party the night before, and this was the first time we went out of our fan base to try, or out of our band base to get, like, a mass party, you know, mm-hmm. we struggled and struggled and struggled with the guy, and, you know, Drew helped us get um, the guy in town to get a dub spot. You know, nothing big, but these guys were out there doing it. You know, they were bigger than us. So, like, what we really wanted to do with Frozen Harbor was focus on bringing bands, bringing our bands, you know, together, getting our whole family together, doing something fun, but bringing a national act to to bring in more recognition to our guys. Maybe help our guys get noticed on a bigger level, play with these guys, maybe pick up some shows with them, maybe their fans cross over and see them and, and do stuff with them, too. And, um, that was the first year, 2013, and man, it's grown since. Yeah. You know, like we, yeah. uh, I think last year with uh, we finished up at 163 bands in two days. Uh, 
two days, ten, two days, ten stages is what we had. Yeah, we added a sound stage. Um, both the Baltimore sound stage is in there, so we have a. 1600 person venue at Ramshead. We have 1100 people at Soundstage, and then we have Tin Roof, English Rock Bar, Lucky's Liquors, Lucky's Tavern, QBR, which we do our country stuff in there, Mosaic, um, Max Tequila Bar, and Wine and Cooper. And um, we try to, you know, really do all different genres. Um, You know, we had a metal scene that was run by Frankie Everly that was really entertaining. We have, you know, a modern rock pop room or pop punk room with uh, Kevin Hawk. Blessed Woods, who came and you know does a reggae room with us, and the whole idea was really to, you know, bring all the bands together. And as our whole idea through you know cooperation and collaboration, like we actually brought in our old drummer with us too. Like we actually last year um, we worked with Tim, Tim Walters from Walters or Alter Ego Presents came oh, through. Yeah, yeah. Um, we had Twenty Four Seven with um, um, Paul Nana yeah. came in last year to work with us. Um, you know that's the idea that eventually we have uh, Billy Bob from Raging coming in we have raging path and Steven sin coming in and um we have the guys from local echo kabuki and uh, laura renee with yeah. the apocalypse show coming in with ethan so like that that's really the idea like frank and i put a lot of work into this um and uh you know this is going to be the first one where i'm stepping out and this is something that you know frank is moving forward with um with one toast and throat of murder and then all my all my blessings man because like the last thing i want to see is things start to fall apart and as far as frozen harbor with, with the work we put together with the fans, the fan base, you know, everything looking back, like, it's a legacy of its own now, like, you know, 160 band events every year in downtown Baltimore in the middle of February, yeah. freezing, like, we are out here now, yeah. <laughs> shaking, I mean, we had, uh, you know, George Clinton last year, yeah, I remember. Um, that was during the one year Blue Hill 20th anniversary show, um, you know, the Jimmy Chicken Shack, we had it on the 25th last year, yeah. man, it was, you know, just a lot of stuff you know that we've been doing and bringing in bands you know from all across the country like you know i think you know we had bands from california play summer camp mm-hmm. we had mac from uh italy mm-hmm. uh, we had mac from uh south africa you know a couple years ago and um you know it's just a great event it's a great experience you know um different genres different rooms you know you walk out of one room and you're right into the next and you're like oh my god this is great and just the idea that we were able to bring that together where you talk about like you know rob how do you do all this like we were talking about 80 bands you know now we're jumping up to 160 but you know it's just you know having a team and replication and being able to you know you know frankie lewis really holds it down on his side with production but now he's moving in you know to dealing with both sides and getting his own production team and everything on that side and you know we're looking forward to a great year this year we have uh some big things happen. Can't really let them all, all the cats out of yeah. the bag yet. But you know, 2019 Frozen Harbor is going to be my uh, my last year really being involved. You know, as far as anything, you know, I want to get through and you know help everybody have a great transition this new year. But you know, that's going to be it for me. And you know, February 22nd and 23rd. You know, you guys want to come out and have a great last hurrah or awesome, something man. like Tennessee. that, man. Like it'd be great it's to see great, all the all the friends and event, family yeah. come on out one last time. But event, yeah. it's going to be a great event, like always. And uh, you know, it's really, you know, looking back, one of the, you know, Jam at the Dam might have been our favorite, it might have been my favorite, but this is really something that is a legacy that we've left, you know, I've helped leave, you know, we're going to help Frank with moving forward for the future, hopefully, you know, and hope it's something that really just moves forward and, you know, is a part of Baltimore, you yeah, know, and, Baltimore. and right now it's like, you know, we can't think of Frozen Harbor without going to Baltimore and what we do, and that's part of our, you know, part of what we do, we want to bring all the bands and the history of what we've you know, in the last 13 years, all the culminators of when we got that band. And, like, it's just one of the things that, like, I'm going to miss, but I'm also just going to be one thing I can look back to. Like, man, when I did that, like, um, you can talk about, like, Tim, you were talking about earlier with, uh, you know, Conum and everything. Like, that's traditionally when it started. Like, the four slow weekends, you know, in both downtown Harbor and Baltimore. And, um, you know, we brought, you know, five to 6,000 people to the weekend with, you know, union tickets that are being yeah. sold through some of the all eating, all eating here, um, staying in the hotels, staying in the hotels. Sites. We did a uh, soft economic impact report. Uh, again, uh, I think it's anywhere to uh, seven hundred thousand for that weekend. For that weekend. For that weekend, that's incredible. People coming into town, so yeah. um, you know, and again, it's not about the money, but that's just mm-hmm. you know, that's great for the city. And but it's, it's good for, for the, the city. It's good for the bartenders. It's good for the, um, good for the bands. Selling out hotels that would normally be empty. You know, all the tax parking revenue. garages, tax revenue. I mean, 
bring yeah, any tax revenue. <laughs> yeah, it's you know, awesome. we, I've always worked off a theory for a festival. You can bring 5,000 people to a place and spend $200 each and make $100. Bucks. And it's not that big of a concept for a comedy show. No, it's no. huge. No, it's too hard to actually achieve, you know. Yeah. But yeah, we, it's pretty light for you. Know, yeah, we've it. really done, we've been really done, you know, a lot of comedians probably want to know how I'm proud of you know, having us. You know, and, you know, good luck to Frank and everybody out there in the next, you know, it is a really good thing for our band and our fans and family as a whole concept that you can do it. All right. Well, it's been more than your pleasure, Frank. Thanks for having me. Uh, cheers. And again, you know, from on behalf of the, as many two fans as I can speak for, <laughs> um, you know, thanks thanks for what you did. Again, we spoke about it earlier. It's a rare thing that you did. It's uh, largely a thankless job. Um, but, it, but it did have an effect, and it did have an impact. And I think people people need to know that. And um, and that and that the young bands that are coming up now need to appreciate the fact that they were kind of at a loss right now, that there's not somebody out there doing that. So with that in mind, if you found out that somebody was going to take this route and mm-hmm. do kind of what you did in helping bands to work at kind of a beginner level, yeah. Um, what would you tell them? What kind of kind of advice would you give them? I would tell them that. just a, a diligency thing um the one thing i always preach in this business and i'm trying to come against it as long as i breathe yeah. um you know some things in my life have changed so much some wishes i i don't necessarily know that i have a passion for you know keep doing it like i did 10 years ago um <clears throat> but uh you know staying in it and staying diligent you know some of the things that some fans get out of it or we've even gotten out of it we've gotten out of it and still been doing it you know and this is at a level where you can stay here stay honest and stay consistent there's going to be opportunities in the future if there's good enough keep working you know keep your nose nose down working and keep your hands in and and, you know just be honest and you know do it for the love and do it for the passion and and good things will happen awesome thanks again brother cheers Cheers, uh thanks everybody for watching this uh i know this one kind of ran long but we could have probably talked for another three hours if it was if it was 60 degrees right now we'd probably and we had endless um battery life on these cameras and stuff we'd probably sit out here for another four or five hours uh reminiscing and stuff and maybe we'll come back and we'll do a round two on this but uh again thanks for watching like subscribe all that stuff leave rob a comment go check out his facebook page let him know um if he's helped your band or if you've uh, seen a show that he's been to that you really enjoyed leave him a comment um let him know um a lot of times people don't that they, it's always good to know um, that you've had an impact for somebody because Rob's impacted a lot of people, and um, again, man, we really appreciate it. And thanks for coming out and doing this interview in the freezing cold of <laughs> fucking Baltimore. It, We're like dying. It, it cold is right freezing now. out here. If you see us shaking, it's because freezing. it is super cold. It's so but, cold. Uh, but this th- is the only place where the lights are good. So th- thanks, Zach, yeah. for uh, for all your kind words, taking the time to do this. Um, I know we were back and forth all over trying to touch base on a 13 year career, but you know it is what it is. You know, thank thank you for yeah. you know letting me on and doing this little documentary interview and um you know touching base on just you know everything we all experienced in the last couple of years here. Cheers, brother. My man. My man. Peace. Cheers. <clears throat>